everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with all of you. Should be a fun conversation tonight. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. We've got a lot of things to talk about. I hope that I can cover everything tonight, but there we go. Might be a late night. That's okay, right? I'm going to spend it with all of you, and our community gets stronger every day. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell, and away we go. Welcome of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the mass. We need a government of action. All right, folks. It seems... It seems like it's going to be a great night. I am very excited to be on here with all of you. Uh, it's going to be a great chat. We're live now on Facebook. We're live now on Rockfin, and we're live now on YouTube. Uh, it's awesome. Quick, quick set of announcements. First things first, the Center for Political Innovation is back in business. And if you would like to join our activities, by all means, become a dues-paying member today. Sign up, CPI USA. Dot org, dropping the link to join in the chat. And March 25th, March, mark your calendar. March 25th will be our next live event, March 25th. And it appears at this point we have, uh, we have, uh, barring, barring unforeseen circumstances, it appears that Washington, D.C. will be the location. It will be in Washington, D.C. Now, we have not picked a specific location yet, but it appears that Washington, D.C. is where we are going to be having our next live event. More details to come soon, hopefully as soon as possible. But Washington, D.C., March 25th, will be the next live event for the Center for Political Innovation. More information coming very, very soon. So that's really a great development. If you'd like to join the Center for Political Innovation, by all means, become a member and we'll try to include you in our work. It's going to be very, very exciting. The other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, we have regular Patreon members, patrons only streams. And uh, if you want to become a member, member on Patreon, by all means, uh, by all means, sign up. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, so if you want to become a member on Patreon and support the work that we do, uh, by all means, sign up. Uh, here's the link to become a member of the Patreon. And when we publish a new book, which I'm working on a new book that is very exciting, you will get a free copy of it. Uh, you'll get other access to me. So it's good to be part of the Patreon community. We'd love to have you. Those are the two quick announcements. And the way this works, real quick, the way this works is I give my opening remarks. And my opening remarks are done as I write down your Super Chat questions. So if you have something you want me to talk about, send me a Super Chat. As I give my opening remarks, I write the Super Chats down. Then... We do the roll call and we find out who is on the other side of the camera, who it is who's watching. Uh, and that's awesome. We find out who's watching. And then in the third part of the show, the second half of the show, uh, at that point, I answer super chat questions for the rest of the night. So if you have something you want me to talk about in the second half of the show, just shoot me a super chat and we'll talk about it. Now, the opening remarks tonight. I feel like I've got a lot to say, but there are times I get on here and I feel like I have nothing to say and the, the opening remarks go on for two hours. There's other times I get on here, I feel like I have a whole lot to say uh, and the opening remarks are very short. So, you know, and that's what's the beauty of what we do here. It's very interactive. It's really about the back and forth, right? There's usually about 200 people watching live. Um, you know, it gets up to about 200, sometimes 250, sometimes we get up to 300, 400 people watching. You know, and I'm watching the chat the whole time uh, and I'm writing down super chat questions. And, you know, I mean, this is an interactive experience. So tonight I've got a bit of a bit of a program prepared for you all. 
I've got a few things that I want to say tonight. Uh, so, uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'll be writing down super chat questions as they roll in. Hit notifications bell. Uh, always good to hit the notifications bell. Uh, and I guess we'll just kind of jump into what I've got prepared for tonight. I'm jumping into my opening remarks. Plato. All right. The philosopher Plato. Uh, he wrote many accounts of his teacher, Socrates. Socrates, the founder of Western philosophy, the great, the great philosopher, Socrates. Socrates, as you may be aware, was, was put to death. Uh, he was accused of corrupting the youth of the city of Athens, and so he was sentenced to death. Um, and one of the most moving texts that the philosopher Plato ever wrote is called the Phaedo, P-H-A-E-D-O. And it is the account of Socrates' death, of the lecture he gave his students while he was dying. And in that lecture, he goes into great detail talking about the separation of the soul from the body, how animals and humans are different because human beings have a thing called a soul. And, and that's what Socrates was talking about. But there's one particular sentence in the Phaedo that struck me. Um, in my book, City Builders and Vandals, I put it at the very beginning. And it's basically when Socrates found out um, that he was going to receive the death penalty, that he was going to be forced to drink hemlock, Socrates said, the same dream came to me, sometimes in one form and sometimes in another but always saying the same or nearly the same words. Cultivate and make music. Very interesting that, that, that when he found out that his death was imminent, that he was going to be put to death, that his time on earth was limited, Socrates had dream after dream after dream. The same dream came to me, sometimes in one form and sometimes in another, but always saying the same or nearly the same words. Cultivate and make music. And that's, that's very meaningful because when you think about it, Socrates, what he was saying there was he wanted to give one last lecture. He wanted to he wanted to teach, but he was comparing his philosophical teaching to music. He was comparing the way he taught philosophy to his students to the way the way a musician performs a piece. And, you know, we talk about the Socratic method of asking questions. And they talk about how a good teacher doesn't just teach you the facts. They teach you how to think. And music is all around us. Music is all around us. You think music doesn't have an impact on you psychologically. You are dead wrong. Music is all around us. You go to a store, you're hearing music. You get into a car, you know, you get into a taxi, you get into an Uber, you're going to hear music. You turn on the TV, the TV programs you watch, they're going to play music. And music and the kind of music you listen to has a very, very big impact on your life. Very, very big impact. But it's not necessarily a direct conscious impact on your life. Uh, you know, it's just it sets the mood, it sets the tone. and music is everywhere and music is uniquely human you know i would argue some people feel like the the birds chirping that's music no no it's not music is uniquely human it is a a form of human expression that is very unique it's very intricate and it has a very big impact on society and civilizations and often we don't understand this. You know, we listen to a song because it's fun to listen to. 
Uh, you know, we we like the lyrics, right? We often think about the lyrics of music. That's just surface level. And the way music impacts us and the way our brain interacts with music is very, very important. And one thing that I have learned to do over the years is to think about how music affects me. When I hear a piece of music and I like it, I ask myself, why? Why do I like it? Why do I like music? Why, what is it that I like about this music? What is it doing to me? And I'm not talking about the lyrics. I'm talking about the rhythm of the music, the patterns. What is it doing to me that makes it aesthetically pleasing to me? What is it about the music that I enjoy. Why do I like it? I'm writing it down. First super chat. Why do I like it? Right? And, you know, for years, I didn't listen to classical music. Didn't like classical music. And then I, had, I thought classical music was boring. And I had a roommate in college who was studying classical music composition. And I told him, I think classical music is boring. And he said to me, Caleb, Wagner is not boring. Wagner is not boring. And so I listened to music of Richard Wagner. And I listened to Flight of the Valkyries. And I listened to the Siegfried Funeral March. And that is not boring music. And I listened to it. And I learned that the reason I liked the music of Richard Wagner was for the same reason that I liked classic rock. It was very climactic and sexual. It built up to a climax. That was how it worked. It was, it was climactic. And people at the time recognized this, that, that Wagner's music is sexually charged. It is imitating the sex act. It's orgasmic. Right. And it's playing with anticipation and it's going back and forth between familiarity and confusion. And it's taking you into a climax and then it's it's calming you down. It's imitating the sex act, which if you listen to a lot of very powerful rock music does that. Classic example is the song Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Right. It's got a familiarity, a soft kind of peaceful melody, and then it kind of gets more excited. Then it goes back to the soft, peaceful melody and it does that a few more times until finally it explodes into this climax. And then the climax is chaotic. And then the climax is very ordered. And then it calms down and you're done. Right. And, and it's this is this is sexual. It's, it's almost pornographic in the music. Right. That it's it's messing with anticipation. It's tension and release, as Sage Rage is saying. It's tension and release. Right. And that's why it impacts you. And that one thing that has been pointed out is Part of the problem is that this technique is used all throughout our society. This technique of, of tension and release, climax, you know, catharsis, this is used all throughout our society. And it has its place. It has its place. I'm not saying it's something that should be outlawed or something like that. It has its place, right? It can, you know, I enjoy listening to Stairway to Heaven. I enjoy occasionally turning on the Wagner ring cycle. But there is an overuse of this method. There's an overuse of this method of using music. And there are other ways of creating very satisfying, very pleasing music uh, that don't resort to, to this sexual orgasmic method. And, and when you listen to music and you can identify different methods that they're using to make it satisfying to your ears. That is a, a way of starting to understand how your mind works. And that's a way of starting to understand art. And, and if, you can, if you can learn how to listen to music and you can process how music is impacting you and why it touches you in a certain way, at that point, you're, you're reaching a higher level. At that point, you are thinking on a much higher level. And so tonight, I wanted to start out this broadcast, this stream. I'm going to play a few pieces of music for you 
that don't impact you in the orgasmic way. They rather impact you in another kind of satisfying way. And I, I want you to think about all these pieces. I'm going to play like four pieces of music. And they're all powerful melodies. And they are satisfying to the listener because they kind of represent order. You learn to kind of anticipate the different parts. There's a, it, it affects you in a different way. So the first one I wanted to play, this is Mozart. This is Mozart, what I'm about to play. This is one of Mozart's, you know, widely listened to pieces. And I had to dig, I had to find things that are not copyrighted so the stream doesn't get shut down. I found, like, people performing these pieces of music. But this is Mozart, right? This is the Turkish March, Rondo a la Turca by Mozart. And if you think about it, think about why you like this when you listen to it. When that, when that melody comes around again, it's satisfying. It's kind of like, it's, it's a rondo. It's like a cycle, right? And when that piece comes around again, you find it more satisfying. You kind of learn, as the first time you listen to it, you're listening to the different parts of the song, and then you start to appreciate it. And then you start to anticipate the different parts of the song playing, and you find it satisfying. But we'll do another song. Or we'll do another song. Why not, right? I will do a couple of these, right? Because again, think about why you like it. Don't think about don't think about the music itself. Think about why you appreciate it, right? This is this is a piece I have loved for years by John Philip Sousa of all people. This is John Philip Sousa 
right? Um, and it's called the Manhattan Beach March. Uh, and it is it, it it's there's there's three diff distinct parts to it. It's basically three different melodies. And again, again. If there's part of it that you find satisfying, think about why. Think about how it affects you. Here we go. Now, it was satisfying for the same way the other piece was satisfying, right? There were different parts to it. You learned you learned to appreciate the three different parts. They escalated as they played, right? Um, the three different parts contrasted with each other. There was something satisfying about it. Um, and we'll do one more of these, just one more of these. Because, again, in a way, you're kind of, you kind of have to teach yourself, right? Because we're surrounded by the orgasmic music, the music that hits you in a sexual way. And and learning to appreciate music in a different way, I think, is very important. But it's a it's an acquired taste. It's something you have to kind of teach yourself to do. So again, this is this is the last piece I will play. This is called Red Wing, and it was a popular ragtime song in like the early early twentieth century. And here we go. It, and it's similar, different parts, anticipation. Take a listen.
So those were the three pieces I wanted to play for you. And I feel like they all strike you in an interesting way. But that's what I want you to do. On these streams, I want you to think about why you think. All right? Don't just think things. Think about why they happen. Basically, on these streams, I'm mainly talking about politics, right? There's obviously some economics. There's obviously some psychology. Nothing exists in an abstract. But I'm trying to get you to think about politics. But in order to understand politics, I'm not just teaching you facts. I'm not just hitting you all with a bunch of facts. I'm getting you to learn to think about facts in a certain way. Because... One of the important things that is in this period that we're living in, we're living in a period where capitalism is fundamentally breaking down because of a long-term crisis of overproduction, because of the fact that the computer revolution has sped forward their ability to produce products. We have a long-term crisis of overproduction, the tendency of the rate of profits to fall, the coal miners riddle, you know, the, the Kid is, you know, the kid is cold. The father says, why are you cold? He says, you know, the boy says to his father, why is it so cold? The father says, because we, you know, we don't have uh, any coal to heat the stove. He says, why can't, why don't we have any coal? He says, because we can't afford any. I lost my job at the coal mine. And then the father and the boy says, why did you lose your job at the coal mine? And the father says, because there is too much coal. We're in that on steroids right now, right? Their ability to produce products and their ability to, create products has astronomically accelerated because of the computer revolution. Um, and the role of the worker at the assembly line has been astronomically reduced. Uh, they, they don't need workers. They, they try as hard as they possibly can to not have workers involved in production at this point. Living standards are dramatically dropping. Uh, they are having a hard time making profits because their profits can only be extracted from human labor. And the role of human labor in production has been drastically reduced. We're facing a long-term economic crisis. And I, I get into great detail about why that is on other streams. That's not going to be the focus tonight. The focus tonight is going to be on the political results of a crisis of overproduction, the, the political results of a long-term capitalist crisis. Because in a capitalist crisis, the capitalists fight with each other and they have to resolve the crisis in one way or another because the economy is crashing and the people are hungry and the people are angry. Sound familiar? People are hungry. The people are angry. The economy is not getting better. There is instability in society. And when there is instability in society and when people are angry, the capitalists desperately need to resolve it. They need their profits to go up again. They need the economy to get better. They need there to not be some kind of revolution. So they scramble fighting among each other to try and resolve the crisis. And when one section of the capitalist class seizes control of the government, and uses the state apparatus to try and stabilize the economy. This is something called Bonapartism. And Bonapartist struggles among the ruling class, it is these struggles that open the door to a socialist revolution. And Karl Marx knew this long before, you know, Louis Bonaparte had ever existed in the Communist Manifesto. This is what he wrote, right? I mean, Karl Marx knew that it was through crises within the ruling class that the working class would eventually take power. This is what Karl Marx wrote. This is what he wrote. Um, and I, I will find you the quotation here. Um, right. Um, let me, let me pull it up here. All right. Um, what did he write? Let me find this quote for you. Okay. Um, I'll read you the quotation where he talks about this. <sighs> okay, hold up, hold up. I'll just find you the quotation here, and then we will get to the point of what I'm trying to talk about. So there you go. My goodness, you know, you think you have everything together for your stream, but you don't. 
but you don't. That's how these things work. Okay, I think it's in this section. Here we are, here we are. Here we go. At this stage, the laborers form an incoherent mass scattered over the country and broken up by their mutual competition. If anywhere they unite to form more compact bodies... This is not yet the consequence of their own active union, but of the union of the bourgeoisie, which class, in order to attain its own political ends, is compelled to set the proletariat in motion, and is moreover, yet for a time, able to do so. At this stage, therefore, the proletarians do not fight their enemies, but the enemies of their enemies, the remnants of the absolute monarchy, the landowners, the non-industrial bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, thus the whole historical movement is concentrated in the hands of the bourgeoisie with every victory obtained is a victory for the bourgeoisie. But the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, but it becomes concentrated in greater masses. Its strength grows and it feels that strength more. The various, the various interests and conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized in the proportion of industry. Right. And this gets into talking about how they form combinations um, but then he goes on to say, and this is the part I was getting to. Altogether, collisions between the old, between the classes of old society further, in many ways, the course of the development of the proletariat. The bourgeoisie finds itself involved in a constant battle, at first with the aristocracy and later on with portions of the bourgeoisie itself, whose interests had become antagonistic to the progress of industry, and at the time with the bourgeoisie of foreign countries. In all these battles, it is compelled to appeal to the proletariat and ask to ask for help and thus drag it into the political arena. The bourgeoisie itself therefore supplies the proletariat with its own elements of political and general education. In other words, it furnishes the proletariat with weapons for fighting the bourgeoisie. So basically, the capitalists, as the crisis intensifies, right? in all these battles, it is compelled to appeal to the proletariat. So as the capitalists are fighting among each other, they have to recruit the workers to be their foot soldiers against other capitalists to ask for help. And in doing so, they drag the working class into the political arena. And by doing that, they supply the proletariat with elements of political and general education. In other words, they furnish the proletariat with the weapons for fighting the bourgeoisie. So the way the working class becomes revolutionary is by the fact that the capitalists start fighting among each other in a crisis. And because the capitalists start fighting with each other in a crisis, because of that, the workers are drawn into politics, and that opens the door to a revolutionary struggle. Right? This is this is kind of basic Marxism, but it's something people don't talk about. There's, you know, I talk about kindergarten communism on these streams and how there's so many people that have it in their head. Well, this is a capitalist, this is a worker. You know, they, they're missing the point that when you have a long-term economic crisis of capitalism, the capitalists begin to fight with each other and there's a division in the ruling class, this brings the working class into the political process, and this lays the basis for the working class to overthrow capitalism by, by um, the divisions in the ruling class. So with this understanding, I want to talk about American history. And I'm doing the same thing tonight that I've done on previous streams, and I, I did with the music. I don't want to teach you this to just teach you American history. That's not the point. I want you to understand American history in a certain way. I want you to be able to analyze events. I'm going to describe to you basically from World War I to World War II in American politics, what happened. And in doing so, 
I want you to understand what I'm telling you in order to apply it to now, because we had the Great Depression before the Great Depression. Uh, you had the Roaring Twenties before the Roaring Twenties. You had World War One, and before World War One, you had a long-term economic crisis that led to World War One. And the capitalist class in the United States was faced with a crisis, and they responded to it by fighting among each other with Bonapartism. And that's the same kind of thing we're in now. Capitalist crises in which the capitalists fight with one another. They try to seize control of the state and use the state to stabilize the crisis. And that creates an opening for the workers. So let's just start. And tonight, tonight I'm going to talk to you about, from World War I to World War II, what was going on in American politics from the Marxist perspective with the understanding of Bonapartism, etc. So in the lead up to World War I, there was an economic crisis in the United States. Wages were going down. The economy, the stock market was always having these things called panics. People were suffering. So one section of the ruling class decided they needed a really, really smart guy to resolve the crisis. And that smart guy was Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was this political science professor. He was supposed to be this really smart Ivy League educated guy. And they, Woodrow Wilson was supposed to resolve the capitalist crisis. And Woodrow Wilson was a progressive. Um, and he wanted to have tighter control over the economy to stabilize the economy. Woodrow Wilson was also a white supremacist. He believed in eugenics uh, and he believed that we needed to breed out inferior people. And he believed overpopulation was the cause of the economic crisis. There were too many poor people in the world. He was very much tied in with, with, you know, the Eastern establishment and old money, et cetera. And he was a, he was a wealthy new England, you know, political science professor. They tapped Woodrow Wilson to be the president uh, to resolve the crisis. And Woodrow Wilson, he was in the White House, and he realized that he was facing opposition in carrying out his agenda of trying to stabilize capitalism. He was facing opposition from two places. One, Republicans. And two, from the urban political machines of his own party. The, the Democrats have always been the urban party in America. They've always been the party of urban centers, Philadelphia, New York City, uh, New York City, Boston, uh, Pittsburgh, Chicago. The Democrats have always been the party of urban political machines. Republicans have always been the rural party. They've been the party of, of rural folks, small farmers, other folks. And that goes back to Lincoln. They were the party of the small farmers who opposed slavery, the free soilers, the people who went out to Kansas and wanted Kansas to be a free state and not a slave state, Iowa. Iowa has always been a stronghold of Republicans. Kansas has always been a stronghold of Republicans. Republicans were the party of the rural folks. Democrats were the party of urban political machines, except there's one, one part of the United States that has dramatically shifted, and that's the South. The South is now Republican, right? The Southern states are red states. Wasn't always like that. After the troops were pulled out of the South, in the Civil War, right after the Civil War and Reconstruction ended, after they pulled the U.S. military out of the South, and when Jim Crow got set up, the Democrats ran the South because the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. They were the party that was blamed for the Civil War. That was so the Jim Crow South was run by the Democrats, and the Jim Crow South was a stronghold of the Democratic Party. And later, when the Democratic Party started to become the party of civil rights in the 1960s. Then we saw a shift and the, the, the South moved to become the party of Republicans. But the Dixiecrats, they were the game changer. But other than the South, the Democrats used to call it the solid South. Other than the South, it's always been Republicans are the party of the rural, small farmers, rural people. Democrats are the party of urban political machines. Now, Woodrow Wilson was a New England, New England, Bonapartist, <clears throat> a Malthusian, and he was trying to resolve, excuse me, <clears throat> he was trying to resolve the capitalist crisis. People were suffering. The Wobblies, the IWW, was leading big strikes and protests all throughout the United States. Big strikes were happening, and the labor movement was, was growing. Eugene Debs 
was a very popular figure and he was traveling around the country giving speeches, riling people up to be socialists. And there was a capitalist crisis. And the section of the capitalist class that was aligned with Woodrow Wilson wanted to push forward an agenda to stabilize capitalism. They believed in eugenics. They believed in the problem of, of overpopulation. And they were getting a pushback from the urban political machines that had a lot of power in the Democratic Party. And they were getting a pushback from the Republican Party. And it was the South was where Wilson had a lot of his support. So Woodrow Wilson engaged in a Bonapartist maneuver in order to secure his political power. And that was that he worked with Hollywood. Hollywood was very new back then. And he worked with Hollywood to produce, produce the first full-length movie ever made. The first full-length movie ever made was a three-hour propaganda film called The Birth of a Nation. And it was a three-hour propaganda film against the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln. And it was a film that glorified the Ku Klux Klan. And it was, it was this three-hour propaganda film. And the narrative of that movie is that everything was fine during slavery, but then the Civil War happened and ruined everything. And Reconstruction was a nightmare. But then the Ku Klux Klan rode in to fight the Union Army and keep black people from voting and save the day. And it, it's a disgusting racist propaganda film. But the reason it's called The Birth of a Nation is that the idea in the film is that the white people of the United States, it refers to as Aryans. That's the term it uses for white people in the film, Aryans, which was later used by the Nazis. The idea was that the Aryans of America, the Southern Aryans and the Northern Aryans were divided but they saw how bad it was during Reconstruction. The black people were just so out of control and, and, and whatever that, that the Aryans of America joined together to defeat the black people. The Ku Klux Klan rode in and saved the day and implemented Jim Crow segregation. And it was the birth of a nation. The white nation of America was, was reborn because we got, over, we got over the Civil War and Lincoln and all of that. It's a disgusting reactionary film. And the film actually has quotes from Woodrow Wilson on the screen. Throughout the film, they show quotations from Woodrow Wilson and his writings on American history on the screen. Um, and Wood it's the myth of the South, that the South was good in the Civil War, uh, that Abraham Lincoln was a dangerous authoritarian tyrant, uh, that everything was better under slavery. That I mean, it's, 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 it's awful. So they, they made this movie, The Birth of a Nation, first full-length film ever made, silent film, propaganda film. And they screened it at the White House a number of times. And Woodrow Wilson and his wing of the Democratic Party and the Solid South, they arranged for this movie to be shown all over the country. The Birth of a Nation. And then after they made the movie, they then had a big rally in Stone Mountain, Georgia, and they refounded the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan was reestablished. And the Ku Klux Klan became a mass movement in the United States. Um, and the Ku Klux Klan was primarily in the Midwest. People think the Ku Klux Klan was in the South. And it was there. I mean, it was certainly there. But it was primarily in the Midwest among rural folks. And it was a way to mobilize rural, rural folks to become Democrats. The main, the main opposition to Wilson was coming from Republicans. And people in the rural areas tended to vote for Republicans. However, however, the Ku Klux Klan said that the Republicans are the party of Lincoln, the, part, the Republicans give jobs, government jobs to black people, and the Ku Klux Klan was a way to get rural people into the Democratic Party. It was also a way to beat back the power of urban political machines. Not only did it tell rural folks not to uh, not to vote for the Republicans, the Ku Klux Klan preached hate for Roman Catholics and the urban political machines in the United States were heavily run by Roman Catholics, Roman Catholics, immigrants from Italy, immigrants from Ireland, immigrants from Eastern Europe were Catholic. And some of them were even Jewish, right? There were Jewish immigrants as well from Eastern Europe and other places. And the, the recent wave of immigration to the United States that was 
going into urban centers and working in industry like steel mills and meat packing tended to be of Roman Catholic or Jewish heritage. And the rural folks were all Protestants. And so one of the main propaganda points that the Ku Klux Klan put out was this idea that Roman Catholics were loyal to a foreign government, that Roman Catholics were loyal to a foreign government and they were loyal to a foreign government. They were loyal to the Vatican. They weren't real Americans. They weren't good Americans. And that they didn't believe in birth control. And this is where it's really weird. The Ku Klux Klan believed in birth control. You would think that they would be religious, um, you know, and that they wouldn't believe in it. But the Ku Klux Klan believed in birth control. And that Catholics were bad uh, because they didn't believe in birth control. That was the idea. That they were bad because they didn't believe in birth control. They were trying to breed out uh, the white people in the United States. And the Ku Klux Klan was saying there was this, this conspiracy by Catholics. They were coming to the United States to have big families so they could eventually outvote the white people, outvote the, the non-Catholics, and, and, you know, and set, make the United States a colony of the Vatican. Um, That was the idea, right? So the Ku Klux Klan was mobilized to push anti-Catholic bigotry, hatred for Catholics, obviously to support Jim Crow segregation and to push hatred and commit hate crimes against black people. Um, and also they were against labor unions. The Ku Klux Klan said that labor unions were a Jewish conspiracy. They were communist, right? It was a communist conspiracy. Uh, it was a Jewish communist conspiracy to foment revolution and chaos. And the Ku Klux Klan assassinated and murdered labor union leaders because it considered them to be uh, communists and part of a Jewish conspiracy. So the Ku Klux Klan was this mass reactionary mobilization, but it was a Bonapartist move by Woodrow Wilson in order to gain political power for his section of the ruling class. Um, and the Ku Klux Klan mobilized one particular demographic of Americans, which is white Protestants, and it mobilized them against Roman Catholics, against black people, against Jews, for a political purpose, right? Uh, and that was what the Ku Klux Klan, that was the function that they served. Now, Woodrow Wilson got reelected as president um, in, I believe, 19, was it 1916? He was reelected as president. He was first elected in 1912. He was reelected in 1916, and his platform in 1916 was he kept us out of war. He ran on the anti-war platform. He said, I kept you out of World War I. I don't want to get the United States involved in World War I. And he was reelected in a landslide on that platform. He kept us out of war. However, then after he got elected, the Lusitania was was sunk, uh, you know, and the Zimmerman telegram, this forged telegram that claimed Mexico was going to invade the United States was discovered and it proved the Germans were going to team up with Mexico and invade the United States. So Woodrow Wilson got the United States involved in World War One. And when the United States went into World War One, the United States, I mean, it became like an all out military dictatorship. Eugene Debs, the leader of the Socialist Party, who'd gotten almost a million votes in the 1912 election, he was thrown in prison for giving an anti-war speech. The Wobblies, the IWW, the labor union, they were broken apart. All the other labor unions had to act like they were big supporters of, of the war and sell war bonds or else they would be broken up and they had to pledge they would not go on strike during the war. The labor movement was smashed. Every young man was drafted and sent to the military. They they had a special group of young men who, if you were well connected, you could be part of what you know this group of young men uh, whose job it was to go enforcing the draft. That was like your job. They had a special group. If you were well connected, you didn't have to go fight in World War One. Your job was to just walk around the streets of New York City or walk around the, the country looking for anyone your age and demanding they present their draft card. And if they didn't do it, arresting them and also suppressing seditious oratory, anti-war speeches, uh, and also selling war bonds and putting pressure on people to buy, um, buy, you know, buy war bonds, you know, from the U.S. government. So, you know, the country kind of became this, this military dictatorship. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about it. All right.
country kind of became a military dictatorship during World War One. Uh, and it was, you know, it was very much a military dictatorship. The Russian Revolution happened during World War One. And in response to the Russian Revolution, uh, there was a, a big fear of communists. And as World War One was coming to an end, um, you saw the Department of Justice heavily crack down on communists. The Palmer raids, they deported thousands of people for being being a communist, um, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, World War I came and went, and you had the Palmer raids where they deported thousands of people for being communists. 1919, you had the Great Steel Strike led by William C. Foster, which was a huge, huge, uh, I mean, you know, it was a huge mobilization. Steel workers went on a strike. It was like almost a, a battle. And then, and then finally, as World War I is over, the Great Steel Strike is over. The Palmer raids are happening. They're suppressing communists. The U.S. economy started getting better. The U.S. economy started actually getting better, right? Because there had been a huge war. The crisis of overproduction was resolved. There had been all this destruction and death in Europe. The European countries were rebuilding themselves from the war. And the United States economy started churning ahead. 1920s, the U.S. economy starts going again. You have World War I is over and the U.S. economy is going. But you still have the Ku Klux Klan. They no longer need a Bonapartist, keep in mind. Woodrow Wilson leaves office. They no longer need a strongman Bonapartist, right? A Republican, Republicans start getting elected again. And the Democratic Party is kind of out of power. Republicans at that point start selling themselves as the party of free markets. They say Woodrow Wilson, he wanted to regulate things and control things. We're the party of free markets. Republicans are the party of get the government off our backs, let the small farmer just do what he wants. Well, the Democratic Party still has this Ku Klux Klan issue, right? The Ku Klux Klan, which Wilson had built to be this big base of support in the Democratic Party, um, the Ku Klux Klan is still a big group. And the Ku Klux Klan, they, they push for prohibition, right? Because rural Protestants don't drink. And, you know, Catholics drink, Jews drink. Uh, but for whatever reason, you know, at that point, the rural Protestants, the Protestants didn't believe in drinking alcohol. So as a result of that, you had the Ku Klux Klan pushing and teaming up with Republicans and prohibition was passed. And then they had a constitutional amendment to outlaw the drinking of alcohol. And it was a constitutional amendment that it was illegal to drink alcohol in the United States. Um, and also during this time, uh, you had huge mobilizations against Catholics that were being mobilized by the Ku Klux Klan. There was talk of making Columbus Day a national holiday. Well, the Ku Klux Klan had a national march on Washington against making a, a federal holiday for a Roman Catholic, right? You would think that, you know, nowadays people are against Columbus Day because he murdered so many Native Americans and he's a racist. Well, in the Roaring Twenties, the Ku Klux Klan was still around. It was a remnant of Woodrow Wilson's Bonapartism, and they had a national march on Washington against, against um, you know, Columbus Day because, Rome, you know, Christopher Columbus was a Roman Catholic. So the Ku Klux Klan has a lot of power. 1924, you had a Democratic National Convention. And I was reading about this the other day. 1924 is the 1924, July of 1924, you had the longest, the longest political party convention of a major party in American history. The Democratic Party had its national convention in New York City. It went on for 16 days. 16 days, the Democratic National Convention went on. The longest convention in American history. Usually the, the, the Democrat-Republican convention is like five days, four days. They, they get together, they vote on who the nominee is going to be. It took 16 days for the Democratic Party to pick its candidate for president. Why? Because of the Ku Klux Klan. Because of the fact that the Ku Klux Klan was still around and it was this massive organization, this right wing white supremacist organization that was very popular among small farmers and rural folks. And they were up against the urban political machines. The leader of Tammany Hall in New York City was a guy named Al Smith. Al Smith was Roman Catholic and he wore a top hat and he was fat and he was a Roman Catholic guy who was very, very popular. He was the head of the corrupt political machine that ran New York City. And that's who most of the Democratic Party leadership liked. However, most of the Democratic voters were 
scattered throughout the country and throughout the country, most of the Democratic Party voters, especially in states that were not Democratic Party strongholds, rural states, Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, places like that, were Ku Klux Klan people. And the Ku Klux Klan liked a guy named William McAdoo, William McAdoo. And William McAdoo had been, he'd served in Woodrow Wilson's administration. And William McAdoo was the guy that they liked. And what's interesting is because the Ku Klux Klan was losing power and because the economic crisis was over, the Ku Klux Klan, even though they were white supremacists and even though they hated the labor movement, the Ku Klux Klan started advocating left wing economic policies. And this is where it gets very weird. This guy, William McAdoo, his platform, even though he didn't support labor unions, he thought they were a communist conspiracy, even though he was a white supremacist, even though he hated Catholics. McAdoo, he advocated a minimum wage and he advocated, uh, you know, uh, working uh, workman's comp if you got injured on the job. And he advocated unemployment insurance. If you read his platform, William McAdoo had a lot of left wing progressive reforms in his platform. And he was a white supremacist. And the Ku Klux Klan and the majority of the Democrats in the country wanted McAdoo because he was in line with their values. He was a white supremacist and he wanted economic reforms. And the Ku Klux Klan, the majority of Democrats throughout the country were supporting the Ku Klux Klan. Whereas the Democratic Party's urban machines hated the Ku Klux Klan because they were all Catholics. So the Democratic Convention of 1924 that was held in Madison Square Gardens in New York City went on for 16 days. The Democrats voted 103 times uh, before they could ultimately pick a candidate. It was a deadlock. It was a deadlock. And they ultimately, uh, it, they called it the Klan Bake. And I mean, it's just, you read about the 1924 Democratic Convention, they called it the Klan Bake. Because, you know, it's like a play on like Klan Bake is like a, a party, but they called it the Klan Bake because it was so hot. It was extremely hot. It was a boiling hot summer, and the Ku Klux Klan had basically taken over the Democratic Party. It was this white supremacist, right-wing populist movement that had taken over the Democratic Party, the Klan, Bay, and, and the Klan. And they wanted McAdoo, and the urban political machines wanted Al Smith. Um, and they couldn't agree with each other. And it gets even more wild than that. The Ku Klux Klan was just over the river in New Jersey having rallies where they would burn crosses. And many nights when people, delegates would walk out of Madison Square Garden, they could see across the Hudson River. They could see burning crosses across the Hudson River. So the, the delegates of the Democratic Party are walking out of the convention hall and they would see across the river a bunch of burning crosses. And it was like a threat on the Democratic Party. The Ku Klux Klan that wanted William McAdoo were burning crosses and threatening the Democratic Party. The urban political machines who wanted, they wanted, they wanted Al Smith. Uh, they, you know, they hated the Ku Klux Klan. And it went on for 16 days. They voted 103 times on who would be the candidate. And they, at one point, there was a resolution put forward that the Democratic Party condemns the Ku Klux Klan and it didn't pass by a single vote. By one vote, they could not pass a resolution condemning the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, who was a guy who had led the populist movement into the Democratic Party, he gave a, gave a speech and he said, anyone can condemn the Ku Klux Klan, but, but we have to unite with anyone to fight against rich people. And it was like the Democratic Party was so controlled by the Ku Klux Klan that they could not pass a resolution condemning the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, the Klan was, there was violence on the floor of the convention. There were fist fights. And the Ku Klux Klan that had rallied around McAdoo, who was economically to the left of Al Smith, they had so much power, they were not going to let Al Smith be the candidate. They wanted McAdoo. So finally, they reached a compromise and they nominated, I, was, I think his name was James Davis, it was just some boring guy, but he wasn't Catholic. He wasn't Roman Catholic. And so, you know, they nominated James Davis and he didn't have a chance in hell and he lost the election. Right. Um, 
And it was the fact that one of the, the major, a major political party in the United States had been held captive by the Ku Klux Klan. Their, their convention had gone on for 16 days. They couldn't pick a candidate. At that point, after 1924, that is when the Ku Klux Klan suddenly became the subject of widespread demonization in American media, which is wild. The, the Ku Klux Klan had done all these evil things for years. They've been lynching black people and murdering people and doing all kinds of things. But, you know, the U.S. media had given them a pass. Right. But it was finally after the fact that they held the Democratic Party hostage for 16 days, they prevented the Democratic Party from nominating the candidate that all the elites wanted, which was Al Smith, who was the, head, the corrupt head of the New York City machine. At that point, the national media started exposing all the Ku Klux Klan's crimes. And they, I mean, and, and the crimes were massive, right? All these Ku Klux Klan guys were stealing money and, and you know, raping women. They, they, they were hypocrites. They believed in, they opposed drinking alcohol and they're all having drunken parties and and all around the country, the U.S. media just started exposing all of the corruption and all the scandals, um, all the scandals related to the Ku Klux Klan. And by 1927, the Ku Klux Klan went from 4 million members to 350,000 members. They were pretty much, by 1927, they were an irrelevant organization because of the fact they'd been started to further one wing of the Democratic Party's power during an economic crisis. And the economic crisis ended. They were still around. And then they were able to hold the Democratic Party hostage at their 1924 convention. Um, and at that point, the ruling class of the United States that had created the Ku Klux Klan to begin with, to use them for political power, you know, they then destroyed the Ku Klux Klan. And that is the story that tends to be how Bonapartism works, right? When they're trying to stabilize capitalism they will create strong man you know strong man figures like richard nixon like roosevelt like you know like like wilson they'll they'll prop them up but then after after the economic crisis is over they get rid of them and this is tends to be a pattern with bonapartists the ruling class some people have compared you know bonapartists to dentists nobody likes to go to the dentist but when things get so bad you go to the dentist and, and, but nobody likes to go to the dentist, right? And that that's what Bonapartism is. And that, that the ruling class will fight, fight tooth and nail against Bonapartist leaders, but Bonapartist leaders are there to stabilize capitalism. So, you know, that's, that's the Ku Klux Klan and Woodrow Wilson and all of that. That was a Bonapartist maneuver that was used to stabilize capitalism in the lead up to World War I. And ultimately, it got out of control. They lost control over it. The Ku Klux Klan held the Democratic Party hostage at its 1924 convention. And then the, rule, the very ruling class that had created the Ku Klux Klan, the very Democratic Party that had created the Ku Klux Klan, destroyed the Ku Klux Klan. And by, you know, by 1927, they were irrelevant in American politics. Um, and that's important history. Now, let's talk about what happened next. So the 1920s, you have the roaring 20s. The U.S. economy is doing very, very well. But then the problem of overproduction is still there. During the 1920s, one of the slogans that was constantly repeated, they said it on the radio, they said it in the newspapers, is they said, Ford has overtaken Marx. That was a slogan that was very widespread. Ford has overtaken Marx, meaning that Henry Ford's economic theories about how to run industry, his assembly line production and his his way of paying workers a little bit higher wages and and all of that had had made capitalism so efficient that all the problems that Karl Marx had described of overproduction no longer existed. And you read about this. Google Ford has overtaken Marx. It was the slogan of the 1920s. The U.S. ruling class said that Henry Ford, with his brilliant technological innovations, has overtaken Marx. Henry Ford was like the Jeff Bezos uh, uh, of, of the 1920s. He was the, the great capitalist. He was the capitalist genius who had figured out a new, a new way of running capitalism. Ford has overtaken Marx. However, 1929, the stock market crashed. It became clear that Ford had not overtaken Marx. Um, and we had a, yet another prolonged economic crisis, a crisis of overproduction. And there was mass layoffs around the country. People were literally starving on the streets of the United States. There was mass hunger. 
People were dying. There was deaths of malnutrition, you know, and the Communist Party started organizing and the Bolshevik Revolution had happened. So you had a Communist Party in the United States. And the Communist Party started organizing the unemployment councils. They organized these hunger marches of veterans. Um, they had the hunger marches. And then they had the bonus army, like thousands of veterans piled into Washington, D.C. They were led by communists demanding the payment of veterans benefits. 1931, uh, March 6th of 1931 was International Unemployment Day, and almost every major city in the country had a communist-led protest demanding food for the unemployed. Uh, New York City, and 1932, you had the, the Ford Massacre, where the Communist Party organized thousands of unemployed people to protest outside of Henry Ford's mansion. So Henry Ford had his private security guards open fire on the crowd and, and kill four of the communists you know, with, with machine gun fire. Uh, and, and there were uprisings and protests happening all across the United States. And it was mainly at first in the early 1930s, it was by the unemployed, it was the unemployed. So Franklin Roosevelt, who had been a huge supporter of Al Smith, let's remember, he had been Franklin Roosevelt. Let's go back to 1924. Remember the Klan bake, the Democratic National Convention? Well, Franklin Roosevelt had become a hero at that convention because he was the guy who got up and gave a speech condemning the Ku Klux Klan and got up and supported Al Smith and supported Al Smith, this Roman Catholic, you know, who was, was going to run for president. Woodrow Wilson. Um, oh, that's good. Right. So, so. So. What, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, he'd been like the governor of New York, and he was this New York politician. He was ra was from a political family. He was related to the other president, Roosevelt. Uh, you know, he was just a standard Democrat. Roosevelt was just a standard Democrat. Um, and he had been a supporter of the corrupt political machine in New York City, Tammany Hall. He'd been a supporter of Al Smith. His debut had been at the Klan Bake Convention in 1924. Um, he was just a standard Democrat. And he came to office... And again, he was going to try to stabilize capitalism. Uh, he made this like short film called Give a Man a Job about how it was important. You had to do everything possible. We needed to employ as many people as possible. Um, and he came out with a blue eagle, right? You had this blue eagle. And this blue eagle was the symbol of the, of the National Recovery Act, the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA. Uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, and that was what was going to fix the economy. And he was going to regulate industry to stabilize the economy. Um, and in the first couple of years of Roosevelt's presidency, he didn't really do he didn't really do very much to help things. Um, one thing he did was he had the Department of Agriculture kill half the cows in the country. I mean, this I mean this sounds crazy, but they sent government men to all the farms and they killed half the cows in the country and then they would bury them and they would put lime on their corpses uh so on the on the dead cows so no one could dig them up and eat the meat and so they killed half the cows in the country and this made the price of cattle go up it increased the the price of of cattle uh and beef beef went up and you didn't have a farm collapse because they killed half the cows in the country that was the kind of thing that roosevelt was doing uh, it wasn't, these were not dramatic measures to improve things. They were just attempts to stabilize the capitalist economy. If we kill half the cows in the country, the cost of beef will go up. And these, these were the kind of things uh, that, that were being done during the Great Depression. People were still hungry. You know, he was giving tax incentives to companies based on how many people they hired. It, was, it wasn't really doing that much. But the rebellions of the communists were increasing. The Communist Party was, was organizing resistance and all of that. Roosevelt, one of his closest allies were the Rockefellers, the Rockefellers, the, the family that owned Standard Oil, right? John D. Rockefeller was a sociopath and he was the owner of Standard Oil. He had bought up. He was like a, an ultra monopolist in oil and he had used his oil to go into banking, you know, Chase Bank. That's J.P. Morgan Chase. That's the Rockefellers. Chase Manhattan Bank. That's them. They're like one of the richest families in the United States, one of the richest families in history. And the Rockefellers, they're based in New York, and they had always liked, they had always liked Roosevelt. Roosevelt was their guy. They liked Roosevelt. However, Roosevelt was running the country, and the country was, things in the country were not getting better. In 1933, a number of wealthy American capitalists, the most prominent of which was J.P. Morgan, they 
started talking about having a fascist dictatorship in the United States. That's what they were talking about. Um, they started talking about establishing a, a fascist dictatorship um, in the United States. And it was revealed by Smedley Butler that he had been approached about using the U.S. Marine Corps to seize the control of the government and establishing a military dictatorship. Smedley Butler was a U.S. Marine Corps general, and he came forward and revealed that a number of prominent American capitalists had approached him about setting up a military dictatorship. Um, and that was revealed. It was called the business plot, and there were congressional hearings about this. And Roosevelt was realizing that a number of people in the ruling class, a number of prominent capitalists, namely the National Association of Manufacturers and J.P. Morgan, wanted to remove him. But why, and this is important, why did the business plot not go forward? Why did they not overthrow him and establish a military dictatorship? Because of the fact that the Rockefellers didn't support it. The Rockefellers supported Roosevelt. It was the National Association of Manufacturers, the factory owners, and J.P. Morgan. They supported the coup against Roosevelt, but the Rockefellers were against it, and they prevented it. This is very important. So then what happened? 1934. 1934 is a year that's it's probably one of the most important years in American history. 1934 was the year that the American working class rebelled. And the summer of 1934 was a year in which there were mass rebellions by the U.S. working class. The summer of 1934, in San Francisco, the dock workers went on strike. The dock workers in San Francisco many times had gone on strike. But this time they were led by communists. And usually what happened when the dock workers in San Francisco went on strike is that their union was whites only. It was racist. And the dock workers of San Francisco would go on strike. And so then the bosses would hire the African-Americans to be scab labor and the strike would be broken. But this was different because the Communist Party was anti-racist. The Communist Party supported black people. The Communist Party had a lot of support among black intellectuals and it went to the black churches. And so the communist party controlled the dock workers union in San Francisco and the communist party made one of the planks of the dock workers of San Francisco, the international longshore union made one of their planks anti-racism. And they said that if they won the strike, they would get a hiring hall and they would make sure that a, a certain percentage of all the dock workers in San Francisco that got hired were black. And they promised to the black community that if they supported the strike and they won, the dock workers union would make sure that black people got to work on the docks in San Francisco. So in 1934, when the Communist Party led the strike of dock workers, the black community supported it and it was huge. And it, it turned into a general strike in the city of San Francisco. San Francisco was shut down by dock workers, led by communists. The leader of the dock workers' strike was Samuel Darcy, Sam Darcy. You can listen to radio interviews he did when he was an old man. He did radio interviews. This guy was a Communist Party boss, and he, he was uh, the leader of the dock workers' union. There was another guy named Harry Bridges. Harry Bridges and Samuel Darcy, two communists that led the dock workers' strike, and the ports of San Francisco, think about all the products that go to San, you know, that went into the ports of San Francisco. That was shut down and it was a national emergency. And Roosevelt was on the phone and Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins were on the phone negotiating with them. There were armed battles. There were a number of dock workers who got killed in the street fighting that broke out. And ultimately, in San Francisco, the dock workers were victorious and the Communist Party ended up controlling the docks of San Francisco, the International Longshore Warehouse Union, the ILWU, was victorious. And the dock workers of San Francisco were unionized by the Communist Party. In Minneapolis, the same time this is happening, in Minneapolis, which is a Midwestern city, the Teamsters Union was controlled by the Trotskyites. And the Trotskyites in the Teamsters Union, they controlled the Teamsters Union, and they formed groups of guys with baseball bats, and they said, no scab trucks. And they got enough guys that if you didn't have a union pass on your car, uh, if you didn't have a union pass on your car, 
you couldn't drive through Minneapolis. And they had guys with baseball bats. They called them the education committees. And if you, if your car didn't have a union logo on it, they smashed your windows in. Right. Um, and so because of that, because of that, they shut down Minneapolis and they set up big speakers to broadcast union propaganda. And Minneapolis was shut down by a general strike led by the Trotskyite communists, 1934. Ultimately, their demand was make Minneapolis a union town. It was victorious. The Teamsters won control of Minneapolis. In Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, the Communist Party led a strike among the auto light workers. And again, the National Guard was sent in. People were killed. It was an armed battle. They were victorious. And in the South, South Carolina, uh, there was a state of emergency. A state of emergency. There was a state of emergency declared uh, in South Carolina because the textile workers were on strike uh, and the sharecroppers were on strike. In a number of southern states, the sharecroppers and the textile workers were on strike, also led by communist unions. There were rebellions going on. So basically the summer of 1934, the conditions had gotten so bad and the Communist Party had organized the poor people and the union movement the wing of the labor movement that was run by the Communist Party was so powerful. And Roosevelt had been threatened by a military coup that in response to, in response to this huge wave of rebellions and, and strikes by communists, Roosevelt started moving to the left. And who, who was it who tried to overthrow Roosevelt? The National Association of Manufacturers, the factory owners. And who was it who was supporting Roosevelt? The Rockefellers, the oil bankers. So Roosevelt started to support labor unions because he saw the labor unions as useful in fighting the National Association of Manufacturers. And his main financial backers, the Rockefellers, were not threatened by labor unions. They made money on Wall Street. They made money controlling the global oil markets. So... Roosevelt and his faction of the ruling class started supporting labor unions. And 1936, you had a presidential election. And 1936, that was the, that was the year when most of the ruling class in the United States, most of the factory owners, they were united. They wanted to defeat Roosevelt. And Roosevelt started talking like a leftist. He started talking like a leftist, like a radical, um, you know, uh, he started talking, you know, you know, he started talking like a radical. Uh, and, you know, you read his speech that he did uh, in this, you know, the Madison Square Garden speech where he said, never before, have, never before have they been so united against a single candidate. And I welcome their hatred. Roosevelt went to South Carolina and the story goes that he shook hands with a, a Southern textile worker. And the textile worker said to Roosevelt, he was going to vote for Roosevelt because you're the first man in the White House to know that my boss is a son of a bitch. You're the first man in the White House to know that my boss is a son of a bitch. He voted for Roosevelt. Roosevelt passed the Wagner Act, which was a, a, a law that made it legal to form unions. A lot of states had a law that unions were illegal and outlawed strikes. Well, the Wagner Act at the federal level, you know, said that you have the right to join a union. And the Wagner Act also created the National Labor Relations Board that was supposed to negotiate and prevent labor unrest. Um, so you had the National Labor Relations Board and the Wagner Act. 1936, Roosevelt ran for president. He was hated, widely hated, but he had, and he started hiring the unemployed. And this is another important detail. Let's not forget this. 1935, not only did he pass the Wagner Act and legalize labor unions and support labor unions, not only did he start talking like a populist, he started, he hired millions of unemployed people with an executive order, right?
With an executive order, he hired millions of unemployed people. Um, and he created the Works Progress Administration, started hiring unemployed people to build highways, to build bridges. He created the National Theater Project, and they started doing you know, plays for children in school. He hired dentists. Uh, you know, Millions of dentists were, were unemployed dentists or people who were licensed dentists who went out of business were, were, were hired by Roosevelt, and they would give the kids free dental care at school. Uh, and there were all these programs. He hired just millions of unemployed people. You know, he hired them. So with Roosevelt hiring millions of unemployed people and putting them to work, building, building infrastructure throughout the country, with Roosevelt doing all of that, he was reelected in a landslide. And all across the country, the employers, factory owners were saying, if Roosevelt gets reelected, uh, you're going to lose your job because he, he taxes us too much. He's a socialist. He's a communist. He's a traitor. If Roosevelt gets elected, you're all going to lose your job. Um, so after Roosevelt got reelected, there were mass layoffs in industry. And, you know, November, December of 1937, they started laying people off. People started losing their jobs. And there was a group of auto workers in Michigan in Flint, Michigan, who were going to lose their jobs. They, I believe they worked at a, what was it? A, a, I think it was a Chrysler plant. Um, they worked at a Chrysler plant. They were going to lose their jobs. So because they were going to lose their jobs, they found out they were, they were in danger of losing their jobs. Um, they thought, well, rather than just go peacefully, let's occupy the factory. And they were led by communists, by the United Auto Workers Union, Homer Martin, um, and, Bill McKay and some others, and they occupied their factory and they seized control of their factory. And it was called the Flint sit down strike. And it started in late December and it went into January. They took over the plant and the police were sent to clear them out of the plant. And so they got all the wrenches and the screws and they threw them at the police. And then inside the plant, they had fire hoses in case there was a fire at the plant. So they sprayed the police and, and knocked the police over with fire hoses. It's called the Battle of Bulls Run. They drove the police out of the plant. And then around the country, the Communist Party and the labor unions started mobilizing thousands of people to go to Flint, Michigan to support the strikers. So inside the factory, you had the auto workers who were occupying their factory. And outside the plant, you had every day the crowd got bigger. Like thousands and thousands of people were piling into, into Flint, Michigan to support the auto workers. Um, and uh, they were just piling into the plant to support the striking auto workers. The leader of the miners union, he was a member of the American Federation of Labor, John L. Lewis. He was the leader of the miners union. And he supported the, the auto workers who were occupying their plant. And he quit the American Federation of Labor. The AFL was more conservative. And so he was offended by somebody in the AFL. So he punched him and he punched some other labor union boss and he punched him in the face and he quit the American Federation of Labor. And he walked out and he announced he was forming a new labor federation called the CIO, the Congress for Industrial Organizations. And John L. Lewis got in front of the plant and, and he went to Mich Flint, Michigan to support the striking auto workers. He got in front of the plant and he ripped open his shirt and he said, if they come in and shoot these auto workers, they're going to have to shoot me first. And just thousands of auto workers piled into Flint, Michigan. There was something called the Black Legion that had been formed. And it was the black Legion was a, was a, was a Ku Klux Klan that allowed Catholics. The Ku Klux Klan generally didn't like Catholics, but there was a, a, a group they called the black Legion. And the black Legion was the group that murdered Malcolm X's father. It was a white supremacist fascist group. They admired Hitler and Mussolini, but they wore black robes instead of white robes. And they were operating in Flint and they allowed Catholics to join. They mobilized all of their people to assemble in their hoods and, and to try and attack the plant. And the Communist Party and all of them fought against the Black Legion. And there was a fight outside the plant and they kicked the ass of the Black Legion. And there was a battle outside the plant. The Black Legion got booted out of there. They failed to defeat the strike. The police couldn't stop the strike. The Black Legion couldn't defeat the strike. And there was just this crowd of people. Those auto workers were not going to leave that plant unless they got a union contract. There's a crowd of thousands and thousands of workers. And like people quit their jobs. Like it, it, I mean, this was a big mobilization. There were people that had good, decent jobs. And they said, you know what? This is 
This is the moment. This is the turning point. They quit their jobs and they went to Flint, Michigan to support the auto workers. There were people who, who mortgaged their houses, who were lucky enough during the depression to own their own home. They mortgaged their house and they, they used the money to support it. I mean, it was a, it was a huge mobilization. Thousands and thousands of working class people all piled into this tiny city uh, in Michigan to support the striking auto workers. I mean, it was just, it was like something we've never seen. It was like, you know, and they, they, they you know, they were like tents set up outside the, the plant where people were living. And it was just like, there were thousands of people all lined up outside this factory where a group of auto workers were occupying the factory and refusing to, uh, refusing to leave until they got their jobs. And so finally it was announced, it was announced that the military was being sent into Flint. The National Guard went into Flint, Michigan. And the military, the U.S. Armed Forces, was sent by President Roosevelt to Flint, Michigan. And at that point, many people were expecting that it would be a massacre. They thought that the military was going to pile in there and just kill them, right? They thought it would be a massacre because these, these workers, they were holding hostage a whole factory that belonged to an auto company and and the military marched into flint michigan and there's thousands of workers there thousands of communists and and the military marched into flint michigan and they they marched in and the military their bayonets drawn and you know the the u.s military piles into flint michigan and they got in front of the factory and everyone's really nervous about what the military is going to do and then there was a historic moment, a moment that changed the course of American history. Something happened that was pivotal, which is when the military got there, they set up their machine guns. They had these machine guns, these huge machine guns. And they had these machine guns and they turned the machine guns away from the factory. And they pointed the machine guns away from the factory. And that was the U.S. Army making clear they had been sent there not to attack the workers and drive them out of the factory. They were there to protect the workers. Roosevelt had sent the U.S. military to Flint, Michigan, to protect the striking workers. He had deployed the U.S. armed forces to protect a group of workers that were on strike. The military wasn't there to shoot all the communists and shoot the labor activists. It wasn't there to drive the workers out of the factory. The military was sent to Flint, Michigan pointed its machine gun away from the factory. It was there to protect the strikers from the Ku Klux Klan and from the Black Legion and from the police. And from and at that point, when Roosevelt sent the military to Flint, Michigan, to protect the workers, to protect this factory, at that point, at that point, it was only a matter of time before the, the company surrendered. And signed a union contract and the workers marched out of their plant victorious and wild story. There was only one black worker who worked in the plant you know, only one black worker who worked in the auto plant. They, you know, they, they wouldn't let him work on the assembly line. He was a janitor at the plant. They let him scrub the floors. And when the com the auto workers, the, the auto workers marched victorious out of their plant in 1937, January, 1937, the Flint sit down strike. They carried an American flag with them and they had the single black auto worker who worked in the plant carry the American flag to make an anti-racist statement, right? To make the point that, that they were supporting black people, they were supporting civil rights, they weren't with the Ku Klux Klan, they weren't with the Black Legion. The only black guy who worked in the plant, the only African American who worked in the plant carried the American flag to make an anti-racist statement. It was a a pivotal moment in American history where the president of the United States had supported a group of striking workers, sent the military to support a group of striking workers. Um, and after the 1937 sit-down strike, after that, there were sit-down strikes all over the country. And auto workers sat down and occupied their factories and, and rubber workers. I mean, it was like all over the country, if workers didn't get what they want, if they couldn't get a union contract, they would occupy their factories. They had sit down strikes in New York city at department stores. They had sit down strikes all over the country. There were sit down strikes, the 1937 sit down strike wave. 
And Roosevelt, the president of the United States, got on the radio and said that workers had a right to occupy their factories. And the Supreme Court said they didn't. And so then Roosevelt talked about packing the Supreme Court and adding more justices to the Supreme Court. Um, and it was, it was a battle in the ruling class. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all of this, this is important, is because the fact that the way people talk about Roosevelt, they make it sound like it was a conspiracy. They make it sound like Roosevelt, you know, and then later, 1937, that's when they created unemployment insurance and Social Security was created in 1937. Roosevelt then went ahead and created unemployment insurance and Social Security. And people say, well, Roosevelt, he was trying to save capitalism. Well, that's what he said, yes. But the reason he took all these moves was because there was a division in the ruling class and the National Association of Manufacturers and J.P. Morgan and Henry Ford were trying to overthrow him. And... The, Rock, the Rockefellers were on his side. And so there was a division in the ruling class and he had to have, it's what I read to you in that Karl Marx quote, he had to recruit the workers. He had to recruit the workers to be on his side against the rival faction in the ruling class. And this is how, this is how revolutions start to happen is when the capitalists are fighting with one another and they need the workers to be their foot soldiers. They start entering strategic alliances with the labor unions and with the communists in order to defeat the other faction. And in order, because there was a military, the threat of a fascist coup against Roosevelt, he was forced to embrace the communist party and embrace the labor unions, right? And this is how these things work. When the capitalists fight for against each other, it creates an opening for the working class. This is how you have to understand it, right? And, and this is what opens the door to revolutions. And Roosevelt... Throughout his presidency, he became more and more friendly to communists. And finally, you know, he aligned with the Soviet Union to defeat the Nazis in World War II. And before he died, in his last State of the Union address, he proposed an economic bill of rights. An economic bill of rights for all Americans. The right to jobs, the right to health care, the right to an education. He proposed an economic bill of rights. Now, Roosevelt, you know, he died. and. After he died, World War II was over and there was no economic crisis anymore. So he was replaced with Truman and you got McCarthyism and all of that. But Roosevelt was a Bonapartist. He was responding to an economic crisis and he was responding to an economic crisis. And that's what made him embrace and align with the Communist Party. That's what made him align with the Soviet Union in World War II. That's what you know made him propose an economic bill of rights. That's what made him pass the Social Security and, and, and all of this. It was done because there was a fight among the capitalists. And the reason that the late 1930s, 1937, 1938, 1939, that's when the Communist Party exploded in membership. They were having their conventions in Madison Square Gardens. That's when the Communist Party had command over millions of people. It was because they saw an opening. There was a division in the ruling class. And they entered a strategic alliance with Roosevelt against the fascists and in support of the labor movement. And that is what pushed forward the struggle and opened the door for the Communist Party to gain power and influence. And if you're serious about politics, that's why I started out with doing the music thing. I want you to understand this. I want you to think about politics this way. I don't want you to think about politics in, in terms of I can, you know, wear a Che Guevara hat and, and take a selfie and feel really cool about myself on Twitter. I don't want you to think about politics in terms of America is a white settler evil country and I want everyone to know I hate America. I'm so revolutionary. I, I, that's not the goal here. It, I want you to think about politics in the terms that I just got you to think about it. Why did the ruling class create the Ku Klux Klan? Why did the ruling class destroy the Ku Klux Klan? Why did Roosevelt enter a strategic alliance with the Communist Party. Why do these things happen, right? Wh what happened? What, why are these events happening? Because right now we are in a prolonged capitalist crisis, a crisis of overproduction. And it is the deepest and biggest crisis of overproduction that capitalism has ever had. And I would argue that, you know, if World War II happened again, it probably wouldn't be enough to get the economy going again, because at this point they have almost eliminated industrial workers. And we are in a prolonged capitalist crisis. And when you're in a prolonged capitalist crisis, the capitalists begin to fight 
against each other, that creates an opening for the workers. When the capitalists fight with each other, that creates an opening for the workers. And there are going to be politicians who emerge, like Trump, like Biden, who are going to have to recruit workers to be their foot soldiers against other capitalists, again, in Bonapartist struggles. And that is going to lead to working class people becoming politicized and being drawn into the political process and becoming interested in politics. Generally, the capitalists don't want working class people to think about politics. But when there's a capitalist crisis and they need workers to be their foot soldiers against other capitalists, that's a time when they bring workers into politics to act as foot soldiers in Bonapartist struggles. So we're entering a period where the capitalist class, they had to create bread to, and they had to create the Proud Boys, and they had to, you know, they have to get people talking about politics because they need workers to fight for them against rival factions. But that creates an opening for us to bring in our revolutionary message and to utilize the divisions in the ruling class to start building up a base among the working class, to enter strategic alliances so that when the capitalists fight with each other, we can be aligned with one faction against another. We can build up our own strength and eventually we can move the United States towards socialism. And if you look at every revolution that has ever been victorious, it has been kind of like what happened with Roosevelt. We didn't have a full-on revolution because it didn't go that far. But you can imagine that, say, the crisis had just persisted and Roosevelt had faced more and more attacks and the economic crisis had gotten worse. Roosevelt would have become more and more dependent on the communists. And you can see a situation where Roosevelt himself would enter an alliance with the con. You could see that happening. It didn't happen that way. But again, if you had just pointed at Roosevelt and said, well, he's not a communist. No shit, he wasn't a communist. But the way struggles in the ruling class develop, that's the only way. The only way that communists have for gaining power and ground and getting the working class into motion is being part of these struggles. And this is what you need to understand. This is what you need to understand. I am on here, just like earlier, I was trying to get you to think about music. And, and I was trying to teach you how to listen to music. I'm trying to teach you how to comprehend and analyze political events. That's what I'm doing on these streams. I want you to not just say uh, America's evil and racist and, and whatever. I'm not on here to just have you say communism's great, capitalism's bad. I'm trying to get you to understand how to analyze events and how to think of them as a revolutionary thinks of them and how we can strategically think. How can we advance the American working class? How can we bring forward the American proletariat in this time of prolonged capitalist crisis? That is what I am trying to educate you all about. And I hope I'm doing a good job of it. And, you know, we listened to some music and then I talked about this and I read you some marks and then we went over the history of the United States from World War One all the way to World War Two, the divisions in the ruling class, Bonapartism. I'm trying to get you to think this way and I hope I'm doing a good job. I really, really hope I'm doing a good job because we need people to start thinking this way. Because the situation is getting more and more serious every day. The capitalists are at each other's throats more and more. And if. It's time for some kind of progressive, constructive socialist movement that wants to make life better for American workers to emerge. It needs to happen. Um, and so we have an important role to play in all of this. Um, and that's I'm trying to get you all to learn how to think like me. So those are my opening remarks for tonight. We got some super chats here. Um, but hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Let's do the roll call. And then I'll start answering super chat questions. So names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you names and locations, names and locations. Who's with us tonight? Names and locations. Who's with us? Who is with us? All right. We got Tom G in Switzerland. We got Richmond of Virginia. Nate in Chicago, JT24 in Mississippi, Mr. Wonderful from Quanah, St. David's, Bermuda, Cedar Park, Texas, Kelly in Waterville, Maine, Yonatan in Mahari in London, uh, Balthazar in Oakland, Edwin in the Philippines, Ishmael in Mexico, 
Robert from Hawaii, Patch in Arizona, Anthony in Texas, Harold in Illinois, Nico in San Diego, Ishmael in Los Angeles, Briggy in Lollipop, Mark in Utica, um, Moonlight in California, Auckland, New Zealand, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we got Cleveland Pirate Alex, Richmond in PA. Uh, we got Bob Troy in New York, Contra Costa, California. Oh, who else? Who else we got here? I think we... Uh, we got some other folks here. We got uh, Lori in Oklahoma. We got David Fox still in Sydney. Jenny Lynn in Cincinnati. Very, very good. Very good to have you here. We got uh, we got Mariah in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we got Huey Long was great in Louisiana. I agree. I like Huey Long. We got Gabby in Chicago. Um, very, very good. Very, very good. Heidi in Edinburgh is with us. Very, very good. Socialism all over the world, brother. You better believe it. You better believe it. Chester in England, Ian Foster. Very good. Very good. Great stuff. Go and go and follow him on Twitter. He does good tweets. Go follow Ian on Twitter. Good stuff, folks. Good stuff. All right. Well, now I'm going to start answering your super chat questions. Um, so there we go. Um, so the first super chat question I've got is someone asked me extreme metal music and its possible impact. Well, the interesting thing. Oh, we got Tyler in Missouri. Don't want to forget you. The interesting thing about metal music, Killian in Milwaukee, the interesting thing about metal music is that, you know, people think of heavy metal music as being loud, which it is. Um, and people assume that it's like other rock music. And I haven't listened to it a huge amount. So please don't misunderstand me and think that I'm an expert on it. But one thing I've noticed about metal music, at least some of it, is that a lot of it is actually, um, you know, like like the 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 melodies and stuff are a bit more traditional than classical rock music. Uh, you have a lot more like older style melodies. They're using the electronic rock stuff, but a lot of times the melody styles are a little more traditional. Um, it's not climactic, you know? Um, you know, I, I know one of these metal groups, um, um, which metal group was? I can't remember which one it was. One of these metal groups, uh, Metallica, they did a version of Whiskey in the Jar, the Irish song, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you listen to the way they did it, right? And you listen to some of this stuff. You, you know, there's metal groups that will perform like old European folk songs to metal. So metal, I separate from regular rock music. I don't particularly find, I just don't find it appealing the way the vocals are in metal. And I don't find it appealing the way, um, you know, the way the electronic sounds are. But the melodies that they use go a little bit different from regular rock in my limited experience. I'm not an expert on metal. I just, I don't know a lot about metal, but there you go. All right. Someone said it's like the human heartbeat, which can put you into a satisfying trance. Yeah, music has a huge psychological impact and it cannot be underestimated. It really cannot be underestimated. Um, you know, and that, you know, that you need to think about how music impacts you. I do. I'll, let me just say this. I didn't mention this while I, I was talking about music, but I'll say this to kind of, you know, close out the music questions. Let's people have more, I guess. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, one thing that, that I started doing is I have made a point of waking up every morning and going to sleep every night with classical music every night and every morning. I wake up in the morning and I drink my unnamed diet beverage with Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, or Haydn playing or Handel. And I go to sleep every night with Bach, Beethoven, Mozart playing or Haydn or Handel. And that, that has made my life much better, uh, much better, right? Just because the, the, the way classical music is designed to impact you is very different than the way most music, most music we listen to is orgasmic, right? It's just orgasmic, right? It, it's, climaxing and all that. And U S society is full of wild emotions and not much rational thinking. We don't have much rational thought in U S society. We have advertising and media that is just pumping us with crazy emotions. And we have people that can't clearly think and digest ideas. So I put on classical music, no, no lyrics, and it's just designed to impact me by stimulating my mind with patterns. And that is a way of setting a tone for the day where I'm thinking analytically and I'm trying to slow down. Um, and I have found that that is amazing. And I recommend that anybody do that. Wake up every morning with classical music. Go to sleep every morning with classical music. That is my advice. Um, okay. Um, 
NetSan, Yahoo, Act Trump, get the USA into war with Iran. All right. Very good. I will certainly speak to that. I got plenty to say about that. So there you go. And if people have more super chats, like I said, I'll write them down. So then the next super chat question I've got here is someone said, is the KKK a dying organization? All right. Well, let's just talk about this real quick because that, that question, I will answer it, but the answer is more complicated than you would think. There is no organization called the Ku Klux Klan anymore, right? There are different groups and I will explain. So the Ku Klux Klan, when it started, just the Ku Klux Klan, it was in Tennessee. It was in the state of Tennessee. A former Confederate general named Nathan Bedford Forrest started organizing a group of guys. Most of them were former Confederate soldiers to go around terrorizing black people and keeping black people from voting. Uh, and it was it was a it was a an armed group of it was a terrorist organization of former Confederate soldiers who didn't like Reconstruction and the fact that you know, that that former slaves could vote and that Confederate soldiers at first couldn't vote. Now, eventually they were allowed to get their rights back as long as they took an oath of loyalty to the United States. But at first, a lot of Confederate soldiers, because they'd taken up arms against the American government, could not vote and freed slaves could. And so because of that, uh, the Republican Party was surging in, in a lot of victories and a lot of a lot of former Confederates, they didn't like black people voting. They didn't like land redistribution, et cetera. And so the former Confederates, uh, they were they were mobilized into this terrorist group called the Ku Klux Klan that went around murdering black people who voted and murdering what they called radical Republicans, which were white people who supported black people and supported Abraham Lincoln, et cetera. Um, and it was in Tennessee. And the president of the United States was Ulysses S. Grant, uh, who had been the president, uh, you know, during the U.S. Civil War. And he'd been the I'm sorry, he had been the, the leader of the Union Army during the U.S. Civil War. And he was very against slavery. And, you know, and so Ulysses S. Grant had the Ku Klux Klan Act, which was a federal law where he sent the military to the South. He outlawed the Ku Klux Klan as an illegal terrorist organization, and he sent the U.S. military to the South to stop the Klan. And they executed a lot of Klansmen. A lot of them were hung for, you know, murdering black people and engaging in acts of terrorism. And the Klan was wiped out, right? And the U.S. Armed Forces was sent to the South to, to wipe out the Klan. And the Klan was illegal. Uh, it was illegal under federal U.S. law, and the U.S. military wiped it out. And it was basically, the Civil War was over, but, you know, sometimes when a war ends, there's, you know, there's a little hiccup afterwards. That's what the Ku Klux Klan was. The U.S. Civil War was over. The South had lost. Slavery was abolished. Black people were voting, et cetera. But there was, in Tennessee, there was a, <clears throat> you know, there was a little hiccup, you know, and the Ku Klux Klan emerged. And so the U.S. military was sent to the South to wipe them out. And they did. Um, they did. Uh, and you know, there was other things, Jesse James, for example, you know, all the cowboy movies you hear about Jesse James. Well, Jesse James, he was, he was not in, he was not in Tennessee. He was in Missouri and Jesse James was a Confederate. He was a pro Confederate guy in Missouri and in Kansas. He'd been involved in armed Confederate, you know, activities. He'd shot union soldiers and stuff. The war ended and he had killed so many union army soldiers and been involved in, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, that he couldn't just go back to being a regular civilian. So he started engaging in robberies, but he robbed companies. He only robbed companies that were associated with the North. He robbed railroads and banks, which were associated with the North. And he was pro-Confederate. And like his robberies were not like, they were not like, it wasn't like he was running from the law. He would show up at a place and he would shoot his gun off in the air and give a speech about them damn Yankees that are, you know, destroying our Southern way of life. And then he would walk into the bank and take the money. And the Missouri state legislature passed resolutions supporting him. I don't think you're an outlaw if the state legislature of a state passes a resolution supporting you. You know, if the, you know, I mean, like, it, it, I don't know, like you think about like, you know, like, you know, Machine Gun Kelly the bank robber in the 19, 1930s, right? If the, if the state legislature of New York had passed a resolution supporting him, you're not really an outlaw. Uh, and Jesse James, it was similar to the Ku Klux Klan. It was, you know, the Civil War was over, but there was like, <clears throat> you know, there was like a hiccup afterwards, Ku Klux Klan. And actually Jesse James, at one of his robberies, he wore a Klan hood. Did you know that? At one of his robberies, to make a political statement, he robbed a bank or a railroad, and he put a Klan hood on his head 
to make a statement. Jesse James was a Confederate, uh, an, a pro-slavery activist. He was not an outlaw. He wasn't a popular bandit. There's a lot of mythology created about him. They made a lot of stupid cowboy movies and stuff. But the actual history is that Jesse James was not a good guy, not a good dude. He was not a, he didn't rob from the rich and give to the poor. He didn't do any of that. And in fact, Jesse James, he lived privately. He had like a private life. Um, you know, he had like a regular private life. He lived as Mr. Howard and he was like, he, he was rich, you know, and he, he took all his money and he was living and he and his wife, they were walking around and he was Mr. Howard and everyone knew who he was. Everyone in the neighborhood knew he was Jesse James. And it was just, his name was Mr. Howard. They Jesse Howard. Everyone knew Jesse Howard. And, you know, he was living this private life. He was wealthy and he was just, just you know, and he had like a double life as an outlaw, uh, as Jesse James, you know, and then, uh, and then one of the people in his gang, uh, basically realized he could make money and, you know, there was a reward for the, the killing of Jesse James. So Robert Ford, who was part of his gang, uh, you know, they were in the house and uh, Jesse James, I think he had a new picture that he wanted to hang up on his wall. And so, you know, he was hanging a picture on the wall and Robert Howard pulled his, uh, you know, Robert Ford, I'm sorry, Robert Ford pulled his gun out and shot Jesse James in the back of the head. Right. And that the whole thing, the whole Jesse James story is it, you want to talk about fake news. I mean, the whole thing, it was, it was fake, right? It was fake. Jesse James was a, he was an actor basically. I mean, you want to talk about false flags. He was a wealthy guy. Uh, you know, everyone knew him as Mr. Howard. He engaged in armed insurgent attacks and he was this famous bandit, Jesse James but he was actually living as Mr. Howard and everybody knew it. And, you know, and, uh, you know, there was a state legislature, Missouri passed resolutions supporting him. It, the whole thing was fake. The Jesse James myth. It's like the biggest, like bunch of bullshit you ever heard. All the cowboy movies you saw are bullshit, right? Jesse James was just, it was politics. It was just like the Ku Klux Klan. It was the, the, the Southerners who didn't want to surrender, you know, the, you know, it was like, the Civil War kind of kept going for a decade or so after the Civil War, right? And that's what the Ku Klux Klan was as well, right? It was just, um, you know, it was just, it was just that. So, so then, right, the Ku Klux Klan had been outlawed. It was illegal. So then, like I told you in the opening of the stream, 1915, they made this Hollywood movie. It was relaunched. Uh, as this mass organization to support Woodrow Wilson and the Democrats, this mass racist organization, demonized black people, demonized Catholics and Jews and whatever. And in, that was the heyday of the Klan was 1920s. And then the height of their power was when they held the Democratic Party hostage in 1924 at their convention. I gave you that whole story in the opening thing. Then after they did that, because they had so much power, they could, you know, hijack a major political party and cause so much of a problem. The 1924 Democratic National Convention was so much of a nightmare that then the national media started exposing all the Ku Klux Klan's corruption and crimes. And, you know, they, the, you know, and I mean, the Klan was in a lot of ways, it was a multi-level marketing scheme. You know, you had to buy so many products and you, you got paid for, for all the people. And I'm not going to show that super chat. I'm not here to talk shit about people, but you know, um, you know, that, you know, that anyway, it was whatever. So, um, so then 1927, the Ku Klux Klan is down to about 350,000 members in the 1930s during the great depression, the Ku Klux Klan started to become less and less relevant. They were still around. They were still a thing, but they were less and less relevant, um, because of the fact that there was a fascist movement in the United States, but it was largely, led by Roman Catholics. Uh, Father Coughlin, for example, he was this Roman Catholic priest uh, in Michigan. He had a fascist radio program and he was calling, you know, he wanted Roosevelt overthrown for being a communist and he admired, you know, admired Hitler and all of this. So, and you had the, the, the Silver Legion of America, William Dudley Pelly, and that there was, you know, because the fascists were aligned with the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church was in an anti-communist frenzy Germany, Adolf Hitler was a Roman Catholic officially. People say he believed in some mystical paganism stuff, but officially he was a Roman Catholic. He was from Bavaria. He, he officially was a Catholic. Mussolini's Italy was a Catholic country. Fascism in the United States became largely a Catholic movement. The Ku Klux Klan hated Catholics. They were a party, they were a rural movement of like rural folks who hated Roman Catholics. And, you know, prohibition was a disaster. The public are largely didn't want prohibition anymore. They wanted alcohol to be legalized. And so 
for whatever reason, the Klan still existed. There were a lot of rural people that were racist, et cetera, but they were really declining in membership. I mean, it was a few hundred thousand people, maybe. It was starting to decline. The ultimate bullet that killed the Ku Klux Klan part two was Superman. And that's a pretty wild story. But during, during the 1940s, during World War II, there was radio in the United States, right? They had radio, right? There were no TV, but everyone listened to the radio. And the most popular radio show was Superman. And because the Ku Klux Klan, they supported Hitler and they were racist, uh, the, the government, Roosevelt and all of them, they talked to the head of the radio broadcasting company and the people that were writing the Superman show. And they decided to have Superman fight the Ku Klux Klan on the radio show. Uh, and they couldn't call it the Ku Klux Klan because the Ku Klux Klan was trademarked and, and was copyrighted, so you could sue. So they had Superman fight this group called the Knights of the Fiery Cross, and they wore white sheets, and they did all of this. And on the radio, every episode of the Superman show had Superman fight the KKK. Um, and, and the thing, so then the FBI... The FBI also didn't like the Klan because the FBI was fighting the Nazis. The Klan were supporting the Nazis. The FBI had informants inside the Ku Klux Klan. So the FBI started giving the Superman writers all... This is like an example of the FBI actually doing something good, right? I'll give the FBI credit. This is the FBI doing something good. The FBI started leaking all of the secret codes, all the secret handshakes, and all the secret you know stuff that the Ku Klux Klan did the FBI started giving that to the Superman writers. So on the radio show, Superman would fight the Knights of the Fiery Cross. And, and then, and the Knights of the Fiery Cross would say their secret password. And so these Ku Klux Klan people, you know, they were in, you know, the South and West Virginia and, and Milwaukee and places like that, Minnesota, you know, these guys, they were in the Ku Klux Klan and they were all excited about being in the Ku Klux Klan. And they'd be listening to the radio with their kids and then they'd be hearing on the radio, they felt they were so special for hearing the secret code. And then they would hear on the on the Superman show, everyone would know their secret code. And that just, you know, that just ruined the Ku Klux Klan because it was like the whole, the selling point of the Klan was you join this group, this special group that only white men can join and only white, not, white Protestant guys can join. And you go through and you get up to this level and they teach you this secret password and then you get higher up and they teach you another secret password. Well, now all this Ku Klux Klan secret passwords were now being, um, were now being uh, leaked onto the radio. So the FBI, by leaking their secret passwords, these people would be like, wow, I spent five years in the Ku Klux Klan before I got high enough that they taught me the secret password. And now I just heard it on Superman. And now everyone knows the secret password. So by leaking the KKK's secrets onto the radio, uh, that humiliated and embarrassed the Klan. And it made people feel like they were wasting their time. Um, and so people started quitting the Ku Klux Klan, right? People started quitting the Ku Klux Klan because why would you join the Ku Klux Klan at this point? Right. I mean, I mean, it was just like all their secrets were on the radio. Every all the kids were pretending to be Ku Klux Klan because they heard Superman fight the Ku Klux Klan on the radio show. They were, you know, and it was at the point where it was just like and, and most fascists at that point were in other groups. There was the German American Bund for German Americans who liked Hitler. There was the Silver Legion it was this weird religious group started by William Dudley Pelley. And there was Father Coughlin and there was the Black Legion. And, and so the Ku Klux Klan was kind of they were a relic of the past. You know, it was just they were this thing left over from the 1920s that people were still doing. And during the 1950s. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, that's when it really started folding up, right? They During McCarthyism, they, they started trying to be part of McCarthyism, but they really just started folding up, right? It wasn't until, like, the Civil Rights Movement got going, right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1954, you had the Montgomery bus boycott. And then, because of the Civil Rights Movement, right, the Ku Klux Klan had been the symbol of anti-Black racism the lynchings, the cross burnings in the South Southerners who did not like the civil rights movement started using, and it's weird because the Ku Klux Klan as an organization had pretty much become defunct, 
but the, it was it was a symbol, right? The Ku Klux Klan was symbolic, right? You know, when you see a bunch of guys in white sheets, when you see a burning cross, you think of black men hanging from trees. So Southern white people who did not like black people, who did not like the civil rights movement, started using the imagery of the KKK to threaten civil rights marchers. They would burn crosses in their yards. They'd have people in sheets, you know, you know, terrorize them. So, so the Klan, it, it wasn't even really in existence, but racist white people were using its imagery as a threat of violence, right? Because if you actually threaten somebody, if you go up to somebody and say, I'm going to shoot you, that's a crime, right? But if you burn a cross in somebody's yard or you put on a sheet, that's technically not a crime, but it was, it was a threat. It was, we're going to kill you. That was what, you know, that was what Southern whites who were using the Ku Klux Klan imagery, that's what they were doing. So, so the Ku Klux Klan in the South, and this is weird, right? When the, when the KKK originally, the, the first KKK was in Tennessee, right? The second KKK was largely Midwestern. The third KKK was in the South. And it was Southern people, and eventually, you know, after a while, they didn't just, you know, they didn't just, you know, use the symbols. Eventually, Southern people who didn't like the Civil Rights Movement started forming their own little Ku Klux Klans. And so you had various Southern people who did not like the Civil Rights Movement starting their own Ku Klux Klans. But here's where it gets complicated. And this is interesting, right? The first Ku Klux Klan was just the Ku Klux Klan. The second Ku Klux Klan was called the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, in that was still copyrighted. Knights of the Ku Klux Klan was copyrighted. I mean, it was it was copyrighted. So so then all these Southern people who didn't like the civil rights movement and were engaging in racist violence and terror against it, they couldn't have the Ku Klux Klan because if they did, they were violating. It was copyright infringement. So they all started their own group. This is where it gets so stupid. They all started different groups with different names and and like incorporating them. So they didn't violate the copyright law. This is like bizarre. So in the South, various people started forming their own groups. Uh, you know, um, you know, they, 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 there was like the Imperial Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And I, there was a couple other different names, right? They started forming them. And throughout the South, people who did not like the civil rights movement, you know, they formed little groups. And there was a wave of violence and terror against the civil rights movement, right? I mean, churches were bombed, you know, and and, you know, people were murdered. Medgar Evers was murdered. And there, there was a wave of violence and terror against the civil rights movement. And some of that was done by Ku Klux Klan members. And some of it was done by just white people who hated the civil rights movement and weren't organized into a group. But the, the KKK started in 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 like the, the the 50s, late 50s, up into the 60s. There was various attempts to restart the Ku Klux Klan um, that that were that were started by Southerners who did not like um, did not like the um, civil rights movement. Um, and you know when Lyndon Johnson was running for president in 1964 against Barry Goldwater, I think we'll show it on here, right? We're talking American history. Let's talk about it, right? There was they showed this ad on television. This was an ad that Lyndon Johnson's campaign ran on TV. Um, this was LBJ. He had this campaign ad. This campaign ad. I'm going to show it. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to show it on TV. I'll show it. It was a, a, an ad about the Klan. Let me let me find it. Um, I'm going to find Ku Klux KKK ad 1964. 1964 election was a pretty wild wild election. If I can find this ad, where is this ad? You used to be able to find it on YouTube. Um, but I, I can't find it. Um, I can't find this ad for the cry. I, I want to download and show you this ad. Um, 1964. Let me see if I can find it. I want to show you this ad. It was a TV ad Lyndon Johnson made about the KKK. Let me find it. All right. There's the, the Barry Goldwater ad. I cannot find this ad. This is crazy. I've seen this ad on YouTube so many times. It's a 1964 presidential ad. Um, here is it. I cannot find this advertisement. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Um, here we go. It's a 19 second ad. 19 second ad from 1964. Hold on. Let me just upload it. Right. This was a television nationally syndicated advertisement by the Democratic Party, by Lyndon Johnson, their candidate. Right. And it was 
it was an ad about, you know, how, you know, it was the civil rights movement was going. Lyndon Johnson supported the Civil Rights Act at that point. It's wild. Lyndon Johnson had been known as a segregationist. He'd been called lynching Baines Johnson. But for whatever reason, his politics shifted. He became, you know, L, uh, JFK was was assassinated. Um, and so he was the Democratic candidate. He was president. And then he became the Democrat candidate for re-election in 1964. So then they ran this this ad um, on national TV, and we'll just show it here, right? This was a national TV ad about the the Ku Klux Klan. Um, let's let's hope it it plays here. Hold on, hold on. Um, all right, hold on here. Okay, here we go. All right, all right. Here we go. Here's the ad. majority of the people in Alabama who hate niggerism, Catholicism, Judaism, and all the isms of the whole world. So said Robert Creel of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. He also said, I like Barry Goldwater. He needs our help. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. <laughs> I apologize for the inappropriate language there. I, but basically, uh, they ran an ad on national TV uh, where they showed uh, that they, they they showed the Ku Klux Klan likes Barry Goldwater, so vote for Lyndon Johnson. It was a national TV ad. It was just they showed dudes in sheets, and they they had that awful thing there. I do apologize. I didn't realize there was a racial slur in the ad. I do apologize to the audience for that. Um, but uh, they you know they they showed this ad on national television. The KKK likes Barry Goldwater, so vote for Lyndon Johnson. Um, and the Democrats, um, the Democrats uh, launched congressional investigations of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the Kennedy administration, followed by, um, followed by, uh, who was it? Followed by the Johnson administration. In Congress, they had investigations of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, there were a number of KKK guys who went to federal prison, uh, you know, for for conspiracy to commit acts of terrorism, crossing state lines with the active intent of committing violence. And, and, you know, because the civil rights movement was riding high and because of the fact that, and you know, that, that there was, you know, kind of a crackdown on the Ku Klux Klan by the federal government um, because, you know, because the civil rights movement, the feeling that, you know, that, that there needed to be civil rights and the KKK made the U S government look bad, et cetera. There was kind of a crackdown. Um, and it's interesting because at the same time, the, we know the FBI was ruthlessly going after the civil rights movement. And they accused Martin Luther King Jr. of being a communist. They blackmailed him over his sex life. They did all kinds of things to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, but at the same time, the Klan, you know, was this wild group of redneck racist extremists that were committing acts of violence. And, you know, they were going after them as well. Ho Chi Minh. This is a fascinating bit of history. Ho Chi Minh. One of the first articles that Ho Chi Minh ever writes, if you go and get the collected works of Ho Chi Minh, you will find an essay Ho Chi Minh wrote um, called uh, called the Ku Klux Klan that Ho Chi Minh, he lived in New York City. He was a you know, he was from Vietnam, but he was a dishwasher in New York City. And uh, and he you know, he worked in New York City and it was in the 1920s and the Ku Klux Klan was riding high. And people in Vietnam didn't know about it. So Ho Chi Minh wrote an article for a socialist newspaper of Vietnamese people um, called the Ku Klux Klan. Um, uh, you know, I, I, let me see if I can find it on the Marxist Internet Archive. I think I can. Yeah, I think I can find it here. And it's in it's it's in his collected works, uh, the collective works of Ho Chi Minh. You can find this this article that he wrote about the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and he's just saying, look, in America, they have this group that that wears sheets. And it's not on the Marxist Internet Archive page for Ho Chi Minh, but it's in, if you get the collected works of Ho Chi Minh, you can find this like informational news article that he wrote as a dishwasher living in New York City. He worked in a restaurant. He was a dishwasher and he was a socialist and he read and wrote for Vietnamese communist publications. And he wrote this, this article about the Ku Klux Klan. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so anyway... That the Ku Klux Klan was then broken up, you know, 1960s, they were violently committing crimes against the civil rights movement. They were being broken up then. And this is where it gets interesting. In the late 70s, late 70s, David Duke emerged and David Duke is a spook. OK, I'll just I'll just be honest about that. I'll just be real with you all. David Duke is a spook. David Duke's father 
was in was involved with the CIA and would airdrop propaganda. He was part of a, this this comp- company called Air America that would airdrop uh, leaflets over Vietnam, demonizing the communists. Right. And and David Duke actually admits that his father got him connected and he did missions with his father, airdropping leaflets into communist territory. And David Duke is he's from Louisiana and his father, you know, his father is in was an American intelligence officer who was involved in dropping leaflets over Vietnam and was involved in, you know, campaign, you know, pub, communist, anti-communist, um, you know, anti-communist propaganda efforts. And David Duke, for whatever reason, he was a teenager. He was getting into white supremacism. He went to the University of Louisiana. He got into white supremacism there. And for whatever reason, in the late 70s, suddenly they rolled out the Ku Klux Klan again. And it was probably related to divisions in the ruling class and the Carter administration and fighting against Reagan. And it was some kind of intelligence operation. Uh, You know, David Duke, out of nowhere, this this young Southern guy whose father was an intelligence and, you know, was involved in spreading propaganda throughout Southeast Asia and was involved in CIA propaganda efforts. This Southern guy. You know, he was all over national media. Every major talk show had him on there and he would wear a suit and tie and he had a shag 70s haircut and he was David Duke and he was the Ku Klux Klan. And he was, you know, he was this sexy young Ku Klux Klansman, Uh, you know, and that was, you know, he was good looking and he was this young guy in his 20s. And, you know, they would ask him, you know, there's a Phil Donahue had him on his show. Phil Donahue had this national talk show and he had. David Duke, you know, just to hear what he has to say, right? He's restarting the KKK. He's the leader. Let's hear what he has to say. And they'd have David Duke on there and he'd say, David Duke, now, Mr. David Duke, do you chew tobacco? And he'd say, no, I, 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 I like mint juicy fruit though. That's my favorite flavor of gum. And everyone would go, oh, it was so, it was, it was propaganda. It was like, it was ridiculous. And, and he'd be like, you know, and I don't have a beer belly. Why is there this stereotype about Ku Klux Klansmen that we all have beer bellies and we chew tobacco? You know, we're just Americans who love our own race. Oh, it was, they were rolling David Duke out there. And if you go see Black Klansmen, the movie that Spike Lee made, that's the version of the KKK they're talking about. And in the movie Black Klansmen by Spike Lee, they miss the point entirely, right? They make it look like the Klan was infiltrating the government. No, The 1978 reboot of the KKK was some kind of government operation. It was some kind of intelligence operation. Uh, David Duke, one of the things he did at his workshops um, was that he uh, he had a wing of the Ku Klux Klan that was called the COINTELPRO wing. I'm not making this up. There was a wing of the Ku Klux Klan that did what they called COINTELPRO. Seriously. And they would make comic books about, you know, black nationalism and black revolution. And they would distribute them in black neighborhoods with a a phone number on the back. If you want to get involved in the black revolution, call this number. And it would be the Ku Klux Klan that would be on the other line. And they would they would take the person's information and pass it on to the FBI. It was one of the things the Klan did is they went around collecting intelligence. They, They wanted to keep a directory of the most radical black people in the 1970s. For the FBI, they were basically, you know, engaging in, you know, fishing expeditions and activities for the FBI. 1979 in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, the the Ku Klux Klan murdered five members of the Communist Workers Party. Uh, The Communist Workers Party, the CWP, was having protests. They had a death to the Klan rally. The KKK showed up and shot five of them on live television. Um, That was a big incident. Um, And we later found out it was later revealed that 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 among the Klansmen uh, were two federal informants, uh, one from the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms and Tobacco, and one from the, um, one from the, uh, what do you call it? From the, the FBI itself. And, you know, it's a wild, wild thing. And then David Duke, shortly after that, in the early eighties, he quit the Ku Klux Klan and tried to become a mainstream politician. He was eventually elected to Congress. So someone's asking me here, they said, is the Ku Klux Klan a dying organization? There is no organization that just calls itself the Ku Klux Klan. Around the United States, my understanding is that there are um, there are various white supremacist organizations, and some of them do the white sheets thing and and stuff like that. Um, but you know, as far as th- 
at this point, the main current among white supremacists is what they call white nationalism or, you know, it's Holocaust denial, you know, that whole thing, right? That, it's that stuff. That's the primary, um, the primary viewpoint among, among white supremacists is they're neo-Nazis. They're like Richard Spencer kind of people. That's the majority of people like that. However, every so often, and it always gets a lot of media attention because of the history associated with it. Somebody in the South will do the white sheets thing and burn some crosses and say, we're the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but it, it, not very much, right? Largely white supremacist elements. Um, you know, they, they operate with different aesthetics, different messaging, right? It was the Charlottesville stuff. There was the other thing. You know, there's different, there's plenty of white supremacist, white nationalist elements in America. There's plenty of them, plenty of them. Um, but they don't generally operate that way. David Duke no longer associates with the Klan uh, and he, he has his worldview or whatever. Um, you know, there are various neo-Nazi and then there's something called the Council of Conservative Citizens. I don't know if people have ever heard of that, but... During the 1960s, there was something started called the White Citizens Council, and it was a group of white supremacist guys who didn't believe in the civil rights movement. Uh, they didn't like black people. They were racist, but they didn't like the image of the, the Klan. The Klan, you know, they were portrayed as rednecks and hillbillies and ignorant, ignorant, drunken rednecks or whatever. So they started this thing called the White Citizens Council. And the White Citizens Council, and they were, you know, they would wear suits and ties and they would just say, we don't believe in racial integration. Well, now the White Citizens Council is known as the Council of Conservative Citizens. Um, and they operate, they are Republicans, basically. They're on the lower levels of the Republican Party. Uh, and they are just, there's not very many of them. It's probably like 100 people at the most, but it's a group of white guys who are Southern and don't like black people. And they, their name is council of conservative citizens, CCC, which is the same sound as a certain other, you know, organization we could mention. So, you know, I mean, is that, is that a modern incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan? You could argue that. I mean, it was the white citizens council and now they're the council of conservative citizens, right? And they're Republicans. They operate at the lower levels of the Republican party and they're racist and white supremacist and you know, whatever. There are other groups too. There, I mean, there's always going to be, I mean, I shouldn't say there's always going to be, but this kind of politics exists in the United States, right? Because of the history, because of the racism, because of everything, this kind of politics exists. Um, and, uh, it exists and um, and it's an ugly, ugly, horrific part of American society. So when you ask me, you sent me that super chat, is the KKK a dying organization? It ain't that simple. The, it is a it is a part of American history that has been rebooted over and over and over again. And it's largely a symbol. The KKK is a symbol of of genocide against black people. That's really what it is. It is a symbol of genocide against black people. The swastika at this point, if someone wears a swastika, are they a not, are they actually an ideologue? Do they believe in the ideology of national socialism? No. If someone puts a swastika on, they're saying, I hate Jews. I hate black people. I hate, I hate, I hate, you know, various ethnic groups. That's what the swastika means. At this point, the KKK is about the level of a swastika. If someone burns a cross or puts a sheet on, they're saying, I don't like black people. I don't like Jews. I don't like immigrants. That's what they're doing. The KKK is a historical symbol in U.S. history. That's what I would call it. It's a, it is a, a, a symbol that has, and you know, the funny thing is if you go to other parts of the world, wild story, it's a, a meme. That's maybe a good way of putting it. It's a meme. You know, one time I was in the subway in New York City and there were two young women from China. Uh, this was before the pandemic. They were from China. Um, you know, and they were from China. They were tourists and they were both they were both wearing shirts with a Confederate flag on them. And so I said to them, like, that's bad. You shouldn't wear that. They didn't know what it was. Right. Because in China, the Confederate flag of the United States has no meaning. It doesn't have any meaning in the United States. Did you know this? Uh, it, or it doesn't have any meaning in China. And that all over the world, you know, people wear clothes from America. There's all kinds of people who will wear Confederate flag shirts, but it, it, in their, their country, it doesn't mean anything. But I, I pointed out, and I had an interesting conversation. It was a friendly conversation I had with these two young Chinese women. They didn't know what it meant, right? Because in China, they, this was just a cool American shirt that they bought in China. They didn't know what it meant, right? Um, you know, and, you know, you know, 
in other parts of the world, you know, people, you know, symbols don't have the meaning that they have. But in America, Confederate flag, burning cross, you know, white sheets, it has meaning. And when people in the United States are bigoted and they want to communicate their bigotry, they want to threaten, intimidate, and be offensive to people that they're bigoted against, they will use symbols. It's, you know, symbols are a way of communicating something. And in the United States, in the context of the United States, you know, if you want to offend people, if you want to communicate that you are a bigot or a racist or something like that, um, you know, you you can wear a swastika, you can wear a white sheet, you can wear wear a burning cross. It it has symbolic value. Um, and and because of the history, that symbol is really cemented into our culture. And because of Hollywood and because people have seen movies all over the world, people all over the world know about it. In Ukraine, here's an important thing. 2014 in Ukraine. 2014, when they had Euromaidan in Ukraine and the fascists took over the government of Ukraine, they unfurled the Confederate flag in the Ukrainian capital. Did you know this? It's true. It is a historical fact. The white supremacists, the, the Nazis, the Azov battalion people, when they took control of Kiev, they took control of the government building and they hung a Confederate flag in the building because they they understand it'd be like, you know, you know, just like, you know, it might be like us waving the flag of some communist group around some other part of the world as a statement of internationalism and loyalty to white supremacists in America. The Euro maiden people hung a Confederate flag in the Kiev government building because they are Nazis. They are white supremacists. Right. Um, you know, so it shows that there is a power in these kinds of symbols, right? That, that, you know, these symbols do have some international recognition, but anyway, anyway, that's a long answer to a question, but I feel like this is an area where there's a lot of knowledge that's not out there. Um, in Australia, the Confederate flag is the club emblem of rebels MC, a motorcycle club. That's wild. Is that because of Dukes of hazard? Because, in the United States, in like the 70s, there was a TV show called The Dukes of Hazard, And it was about two Southern guys who have like a car and get involved in like action car chases. And they had Confederate flags on their car. So is that why that is, David? That might be why it is. It might be because of Dukes of Hazard, right? Because they're supposed to be like poor people from Kentucky or something. And because, you know, they're supposed to be poor people, white poor people from Kentucky, they, they you know, they have, they have that on their, on their car. So maybe that's the association. But yeah. The Confederate flag is an awful symbol. It's a it, it's a horrendous symbol. And if and one of the most wild thing. Well, anyway, I could talk about the Confederate flag and how awful it is all night. But I, let's get to our next thing. Next thing. Uh, John McCarthy says Stone Mountain is the same place that Bill Clinton launched his tough on crime agenda. Well, not not shocking, is it? Not shocking at all. Kind of like Reagan having a rally in M money, Mississippi, where he announced he believed in states rights. Right. That that, you know, politicians will push that button every so often, um, you know, and and I mean, it's wild. We're doing the whole woke thing in the United States. But there you go. So now Tyler is saying I've got to talk about the Speaker of the House madness again. The Republicans are fighting within their own camp. And some of these Republicans genuinely believe in their principles and they're willing to fight for it. And Jimmy Dore has been proven correct. Right. What what they were all saying to Jimmy Dore when Jimmy Dore said that the squad shouldn't vote for Nancy Pelosi unless they got what they want, the response of Anna Kasparian and all these people was, that's stupid. That's stupid. Well, no, it ain't. Because the Republicans are doing it. What Jimmy Dore said was possible for the Democrats to do, to fight for Medicare for all and demand a vote in exchange for electing their Speaker of the House, Republicans are now doing. Republicans are now doing what the you know the the democrats all said could not be done they all said it couldn't be done and it was um so you know i mean i think that's you know that was that was important and jimmy dore is being proven correct jimmy dore is being proven correct that if the democrats really wanted medicare for all they could get it they just don't want it the squad is a fraud the fraud squad right and Jimmy Dore has been proven right. And and the fact that these people can't wrap their minds around that. I mean, it's it's shocking. Um, it's shocking. But, you know, Jimmy Dore is absolutely right. And he's being proven correct. So there we go. There we go. All right. 
discuss the persecution of Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was a great actor in Hollywood. Uh, he made the transition. He was originally in silent movies, uh, and then he transitioned to being in live action movies. His voice was good enough. He made the transition. Um, and Charlie Chaplin, he made a great, uh, he was a friend of the Communist Party. He had fundraisers for William Z. Foster at his mansion. He never joined the Communist Party, but he was very sympathetic and very friendly. And he was born in Britain. Uh, and after, um, after the, um, you know, Second World War was over, they destroyed him for his, you know, his, the fact he was a communist sympathizer. He had to flee the United States. He was basically deported and he lived most of his, he retired at, basically, he retired to Ireland and he lived in Ireland. Uh, there's a statue of him in Ireland uh, and he lived in Ireland, um, you know, and he was loved by the Irish people, but he was basically kicked out of the United States for being a, a communist. And, you know, the speech that he makes at the end of his movie, The Great Dictator, is beautiful. Uh, the Great Dictator uh, is a movie he made, and it's, I, I don't particularly care for the movie very much. It's kind of a silly, it's like a satire commentary on the rise of fascism. But then at the end of the movie, he makes this beautiful, beautiful um, speech about overproduction and capitalism and fascism and capitalism leading toward fascism. It's beautiful. It's just a beautiful, beautiful speech. Uh, that he makes at the end of the movie. And you read, you listen to the speech. It's the line of the Communist International. So there you go. All right. Next question. Um, someone said they found the clip that I showed a couple nights ago of North Korea on uh, New Year's Eve to be very moving. They don't take their survival for granted. You know, I am going to show a lot more um, videos from North Korea on this stream because North Korea is so demonized and so misrepresented in U.S. media. and the, the hope for peace should be higher than ever. And right now we're seeing everything that Trump did on the Korean Peninsula is being reversed. You know, they're rolling it back. They're, they're practicing nuclear destruction in North Korea again. And North Korea is expanding its nuclear. Everything is the hope for peace is being reversed. And, uh, you know, and the North Koreans are brave, heroic anti-imperialists. They stand in solidarity. They supported the Black Panthers. They've supported the Palestinians. They supported Gaddafi. They supported Nelson Mandela. The, everywhere that people have been fighting against injustice, um, you know, everywhere, um, everywhere that uh, that people have fought against injustice, North Korea has been on their side. Um, so, you know, I I I'm going to show a lot more videos. I don't have time tonight because I'm running out of energy and we got a lot more super chats to get through. But there's another video from North Korea. I'll probably show tomorrow night. But I just want to, I want us all to know the North Koreans and understand them. I've been reading from the biographies of, you know, I've been reading on this stream. We've done a couple readings from the life and revolutionary activities of, of, of Kim, Il, Kim Il-sung. Uh, we'll do more readings on here. We're going to, you know, you know, the Communist Party has stabbed North Korea in the back. They condemned them for their nuclear testing and they, they cut ties with North Korea. Uh, uh, other than like the Workers' World Party, uh, nobody in America, none of the so-called communist groups support North Korea. I think the Party of Communists does, the Workers' World Party does. Well, the Center for Political Innovation supports North Korea. Now, that doesn't mean we want to copy their system or we think that they're, the way that they exist is ideal. No, we recognize that they're under attack and they're fighting for their lives and they have achieved miracles for their people, wiped out illiteracy, universal housing, and they're under the threat, and we want to have solidarity with them against U.S. imperialism. And we want them to not have to be as authoritarian as they are. We want them to have a more free and open society. That's what we'd like to see, right? And the way they can have a more free and open society is if U.S. imperialism gets off their back. And if they're able to have peace and, and reunify with their southern country folk and, and have foreign investment, right? And that, that supporting North Korea, it doesn't mean you idealize their situation. You recognize that they've had it really rough. And the fact that they've pulled through shows that the, so, the socialist methods that they've used and the, 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 the teachings of the Korean Workers' Party and Juche have a lot to offer. And there's a lot we can learn from them. But we also recognize that they're in a bad situation and they need our help. They need our solidarity. Americans need to support North Korea. We need to stand in solidarity with the people of North Korea against everything they're up against. And we need America to lift the sanctions on them and let them trade on the international market. We need those troops in the southern half of the Korean peninsula to go home. You know, I mean, this is just common sense talk. And and the Communist Party has betrayed North Korea. Uh, many of the Marxist groups have 
you know, turned their back on North Korea. We need to stand in solidarity with North Korea. So we're going to, that'll be a recurring theme on these lives is, is solidarity with North Korea against U.S. imperialism. All right, next question. What's going on in Turkey? You know, again, I, I've, I've addressed that on previous lives, but the Turkish government is like a Bonapartist. Uh, it's, you know, kind of a bourgeois nationalist government. It's not solidly in the anti-imperialist camp with Russia, but it's not solidly with the United States. It's a member of NATO and they're threatening to kick it out of NATO because it's friendly to Russia. And, you know, and and because of international circumstances and negotiations, they're starting to be friendlier with the Syrian government and things are changing. And yeah, peace would be good. Peace would be great. All right. Next question. Netanyahu backed Trump to get the USA into a war with Iran. I don't think it's necessarily that. I mean, that's part of it. Anti-Iran was a big theme in the Trump administration. They ruthlessly murdered Qasem Soleimani. They got us to the brink of war with Iran. Uh, Netanyahu is obsessed with demonizing Iran. Uh, and Trump Trump was in with the Netanyahu crowd. And that Obama pushed the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, whereas, you know, the Netanyahu crowd in Israel, the Israeli far right wing, they need to demonize Iran and escalate tensions with Iran for their own political reasons. And Trump was in with the weapons manufacturers and there's money to be made, um, you know. Uh, and so, I, you know, there are divisions in the ruling class. You know, Israel is at this weird turning point where the Netanyahu wing seems to have the upper hand, despite the fact that there's a lot of a lot of Israelis that are not as far to the right. And, you know, there's the settler populism going on with a lot of recent, you know, recent, you know, moving to Israel by Jews from like Eastern Europe who are much more right wing. And, you know, whereas yeah, it, it's complicated. Right. Um, but, yeah, Trump has been in with the Netanyahu crowd crowd for quite some time. And that one thing that I've pointed out, and I pointed this out on, um, on, I'll, I'll just say this, I'll just throw this out there, right? This is something I can say about this. I pointed this out on, um, uh, on Sputnik radio, on interviews I've done, uh, you know, go, go listen to the critical hour. It's a great radio show. I go on there all the time. One thing I pointed out is, is like American politics is like haunted by the specter of anti-Semitism. It's very, very weird. Your typical Trump supporter is a supporter of Israel and thinks that Democrats are all supporters of Islamic terrorism and want to kill Jews. Your typical Democrat is a supporter of Israel and thinks that Trump supporters are all a bunch of neo-Nazis who want to kill Jews. It's weird. It's very, very, very odd. Trump supporters are fanatical supporters of Israel. There were huge, a huge number of Israeli flags in the in the January 6th crowd. Netanyahu's people, all the Israeli Likudniks were bust in. But yet liberals think all Trump supporters want to kill all the Jews. Meanwhile, Trump supporters, they think all Democrats are supporters of Islamic terrorism and, and want to kill all the Jews. It's bizarre. It is utterly, utterly bizarre. It is one of the weirdest things. Both sides are pro-Israel, but they try to pretend and they get their base psyched up that the other side isn't. But then it gets even weirder, right? Do you remember the 2004 election? 2004 election. John Kerry was the Democrat candidate, big supporter of Israel. He actually claimed that he he had Jewish heritage, even though he's, he's an Irishman, right? John Kerry. He claimed, though, that he was of Jewish heritage. His family just changed their last name. He was actually, he claimed he was Jewish, even though he was Roman Catholic. He, he claimed to be of Jewish heritage. Bush, the candidate of the Republicans, he was also a big supporter of Israel, huge supporter of Israel, et cetera. So we had the Bush administration that was supporting Israel. We had the Democrats who were supporting Israel. But Pat Buchanan, he had the quote of the year. He said that the 2004 election was Michael Moore versus Mel Gibson because it was. That summer, two movies came out and all the people who voted for Kerry went and saw Fahrenheit 9-11, which was a movie made by Michael Moore. It was like a leftist critique of the Bush administration. Well, Michael Moore supports the Palestinians. He dedicated one of his books to Rachel Corey who was the, the solidarity activist who was killed by the Palestinians. She's from Seattle, from, from Washington State. She was killed by Israel. She was a Palestine solidarity activist, was killed by Israel. Michael Moore dedicated one of his books to her. Michael Moore is not pro-Israel. Or maybe he is now, but he didn't used to be. 
Meanwhile, Mel Gibson, his dad is a Holocaust denier. And everybody knows Mel Gibson is not a supporter of Israel, right? I mean, he's been caught on tape saying all kinds of things about Jews and all kinds of things. Mel Gibson is not a supporter of Israel. And Mel Gibson made The Passion of the Christ, which was this Christian movie about Jesus's persecution and death and all the evangelicals piled into the theaters to go watch, to go watch The Passion of the Christ and, and that the evangelicals. And that's what won the election for Bush, right? It was the gay marriage, opposition to gay marriage. The evangelical vote is ultimately what won the elections for Bush. So the 2004 election, you had two pro-Israel candidates. But they were getting support and the base was being rallied by two anti-Israel Hollywood guys. And now you fast forward to 20, 2022. And again, Trump and his supporters are all pro-Israel. But the Democrats think that they're all neo-Nazis and want to kill all the Jews. Right? Democrats are all pro-Israel, but Trump supporters think that they're all supporters of Palestine and Islamic terrorism and want to kill all the Jews. This is a weird time. This is a weird, weird moment. I have a feeling that there's a lot more anti-Israel sentiment than you would think. I have a feeling that there's a lot among a lot of right-wingers. They just don't get the Israel thing. And the evangelical churches all support Israel and the Republican Party all support Israel. But I have a feeling there's a lot of right-wingers who are just like, why are we spending all this money? Why are we doing this? They just don't care. Also, I think that among Democrats, right, we saw Ilan Omar, you know, she's a Muslim. She did a lot of performative anti-Israel stuff. And I think that among a lot of rank and vile Democrats, there's a lot of opposition to Israel as well. You know, and every so often it comes above the surface and then they have to apologize and like, I got to tell you, the dirty, dirty little secret of American politics that no one wants to acknowledge is that on both sides, Republican and Democrat, a lot of Americans are sick and tired of billions of our tax dollars going to support Israel. A lot of Americans don't appreciate the power and influence that the American Israeli Political Action Committee has. Beneath the surface... Millions and millions and millions of Americans who voted for Trump and millions and millions of Americans who voted for Biden don't like Israel. I'm just telling you the truth, right? And no one wants to acknowledge that. And they have cra they passed some of the stupidest, crazy laws. If you work for the state of New York, you have to sign an oath that you will not boycott Israel. And a number of states have laws like this on the books that if you're a teacher in certain states, one of the things you must sign is I am not boycotting Israel just to get a job as a teacher. Now, you know, they used to do this during McCarthyism. Thank you, Lanny. Thank you. During McCarthyism, a lot of states required teachers to sign loyalty oaths to America, right? A lot of, a lot of states, you had to sign loyalty oaths to the country, right? You had to swear you weren't a communist. And that a lot of people said that's bullshit, right? You, you want to be a teacher? You can be a communist. You want to be a federal government employee? You can be a communist. Why? I mean, what is this? You know, in order to work, I think even now in the state of California, in order to be a teacher, you must sign that I'm not a communist and I am, I, I'm loyal to America. And even that is kind of bullshit, right? But now in a number of states, you have to sign a loyalty oath to a foreign government. And it's not just a loyalty oath. It's that you will not boycott a foreign government. Now, what does not boycotting mean? That means you, you buy from them. Boycotting is simply you don't buy from somebody. So basically, in order to get a job in the state of New York, in order to get a job in a number of states, you must sign a document that says, I will buy from Israeli companies. I will buy from countries that I, I will not boycott, meaning I will actively spend my money to buy products from Israeli companies. Now, do you want to talk about a bizarre, screwed up relationship? The U.S. relationship with Israel is bizarre, screwed up, and unhealthy. Let me just say that. Like, I mean, there's no way, other way of describing it. Israel has a huge amount of influence over our politics. Israel has a huge amount of power 
right? I mean, but beneath the surface, all kinds of Americans don't agree with it. All kinds of Americans don't agree with it, but everyone's afraid to say it. And it's like this weird taboo in America. No one ever will criticize Israel. Everyone accuses everyone else of being anti-Semitic, right? Republicans think Democrats are anti-Semitic. Democrats think Republicans are anti-Semitic. Everyone on the, on the political stage does this silly performance of how much they love Israel. But beneath the surface, it's pretty obvious most Americans don't like Israel on the left and the right. I'm just going to talk about it, right? And and this itself, I've been called an anti-Semite so many times, not anti-Semitic. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for a lot of Jewish folks that were communists that taught me everything I know. I work with Jewish people. Some of my best friends are Jews. And, you know, the Jewish religion has been hijacked and used for Zionism. But Judaism, the actual Jewish religion is contrary to Zionism. And I've interviewed rabbis about that before. You know, I'm not opposed to Judaism, whether as an ethnicity or or a religion, you know. Anti-Semitism is not good. I oppose all forms of anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is socialism for fools, right? If you can't, you know, if you can't understand, the problem is capitalism, right? The problem, you, you have to come up with some silly conspiracy theory about, you know, the Jews, the Jews, right? You know, so anti-Semitism is, is socialism for fools, and it's stupid. When you look at anti-Semitic literature, it's some of the dumbest shit I've ever read, you know? You know, I mean, but that's a whole nother story. But I'm just saying, the U.S. relationship with Israel is strange. It's strange because deep down, if you really were to get an honest answer, most Americans would tell you they don't really get why we have to support Israel. They're not really into it. They're not really into it. And, you know, something's the U.S. relationship with Israel is going to go down in history as weird weird that's what it's going to go down in it's going to go down in history as weird because it's just something that nobody ever nobody dares touch with a 10 foot pole right if you want a mainstream media career you want to be in hollywood you want to be a major political figure in this country i love israel israel can do no wrong etc you know and uh it's very very weird and every so often, something weird will happen in relation to U.S. relations with Israel. And you have to go, wait, what does that mean? For example, there was a politician here in New York City. And this politician in New York City, I will never forget this, right? This politician in New York City, African-American politician, Democrat, he was speaking at a pro-Israel rally here in New York City. And he said, Israel today, Israel tomorrow, Israel forever. And the crowd applauded. But if you think about it, he knew what he was doing because that is a reference to segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. So why did he say that? And he's a black politician. He knows that that was a very famous white supremacist pro-segregation statement. And this guy, he's a mainstream New York politician, African-American. He gets up and he says, Israel today, Israel tomorrow, Israel forever. And the crowd applauds. And that clip goes viral on the internet. And people are like, wait a second. Was he subtly trolling them? Was he calling that crowd of pro-Israel people white supremacists? Or like, what was going on? That was weird because this guy, I mean, he's a pro-Israel politician. I mean, he's a very pro-Israel politician. He gave a pro-Israel speech, but then he ends it with that. And you wonder, was that a subtle dig? Very weird. The other thing that happened, thank you, Lanny. You're digging this. There you go. The other thing that happened that was weird, Bernie Sanders spoke in Harlem, right? And I remember this, when during the 2016 campaign, Bernie Sanders is campaigning in Harlem. He's got Nina Turner standing next to him, up next to him. They're having a Q&A, and an African-American man gets on the microphone, 
and says, Bernie Sanders, aren't you a Jew? Don't the Jews control all of Hollywood? Don't the and started going on an anti-Semitic tirade. And of course, the audience this is New York City. The audience starts booing, like boo, boo. And Nina Turner gets up there and she says, Now we oppose all forms of bigotry. We oppose all kinds of anti-Semitism. But then Bernie Sanders gets up. Right? Now Nina Turner's said he opposes anti-Semitism. The crowd is booing the guy who said the anti-Semitic stuff. And then Bernie Sanders gets up there and he says. I am very critical of Israel. And he starts talking about how he's got a record of being critical of Israel. He supports Israel, but he's very critical of them. What in the world is going on there? Right? Was Did Hillary Clinton send that guy to just promote ethnic bigotry against Bernie Sanders? What I mean, it was fair. It was a weird moment. It's also here in New York City where Bernie Sanders, who is Jewish, is getting Jew baited. He's getting anti-Semitic stuff shouted at him by somebody, and then his his response is to say, "Well, you know, I'm quite critical of Israel. I support him, but I'm not totally there." Like that guy didn't say anything about Israel. Like, what's going on here? What's going on here? It's very, very, very weird. There's a lot of weird stuff that goes on beneath the surface. There's all kinds of weird, like coded messages. Whenever they start talking about Israel, it's like, it's very clear that there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of weird stuff. Every so often, the Trump camp will do some weird stuff around Israel also, right? There was some weird stuff from the Trump White House about Israel also. You know, I, I, you know, there's, and they were calling them anti-Semitic, even though they were more pro-Israel than any, anybody. I mean, they were, you know, Trump and Netanyahu were buddy, buddy. And, and the USA, they actually moved the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, you know, to make a political statement. And, you know, the Trump administration in terms of policy was very pro-Israel, but every so often they would say something or do something that was like some kind of like coded dig at Israel. And the Democrats would flip out and call Trump anti-Semitic. Right. And then you'll remember just as as Obama was leaving office, like the election had already happened. The 2016 election had already happened, already happened. It was over. And Trump was going to come into office. And it's like at the last minute, just at the last minute. Right. Trump is going to get inaugurated. 2016. John Kerry has a press conference. John Kerry, the secretary of state has a press conference and goes on this anti-Israel tirade, criticizing Israel, right? Just reading this statement against Israel, right? Now, of course, he says, he starts it out by saying, oh, the USA loves Israel. We all love Israel, but Israel is blah, 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 blah. And in his statement, he says, Israel can be either democratic or Jewish, but it can't be both. You know? What was that? What in the world was that about? And that statement was intended. It was intended to be taken out of. Co- it was like a like a dig. And of course, the, the Republicans went nuts and said, oh, my God, he said that you can't be Jewish and believe in democracy. And they were losing their mind. The Democrats are anti-Semitic. You know, it was weird. It was really, really, really weird. And you almost wonder, is that because of perceived Israeli support for Trump. They decided to just, you know, as Obama was leaving office, they were going to take make a dig at, at Israel like that. It was very weird. It was extremely weird. But Israel come, I mean, John Kerry decides to just have a national press conference. It starts out doing the whole, yeah, I love Israel thing. Then he starts going over Israel's crimes and then he just throws out and it's got one sentence in there that is like, whoa, what is that? Israel can be either democratic or Jewish, but it can't be both. And it's like, that's like that's like fighting words, right? That's like something that you say to somebody, you know, in a bar, and next thing you know, you're having a fist fight in a bar. It was very weird. And so it's like both sides are pretending to be or both sides outdo each other in trying to be pro-Israel. Both sides tell their base the other side hates Jews. And then every so often, both sides do like a subtle dig. Every so often, both sides, they'll just like get a subtle, like, we don't really like you, Israel. 
every so often, it's the weirdest thing. The Trump White House, every so often they would do something. I forget some of the things they did. And then every so often the Obama White House would do something. So it's like almost like the American political establishment almost doesn't appreciate supporting Israel. And every so often they do something just as a jab, or maybe they're trying to throw a bone to the, the fact that Americans really don't support Israel deep down. It's weird. It is really, really weird. It is so bizarre. It's like either everybody knows that deep down, the majority of Americans aren't really fanatical supporters of Israel. A lot of evangelicals are. Obviously, a lot of Jewish Americans are. You know, uh, the majority of Zionists in America are not Jewish, by the way. So if you say that that Zionist, if, if ranting against Zionism is code for Jew, that's not true, right? Because the majority, the majority of American Zionists are Christians. Did you know that? The majority of American Zionists are Christians. They are evangelical Christians. The overwhelming majority of Americans who identify as Zionists and supporters of Israel are Christians. So that's bizarre as well. So... Yeah, I, I've ranted about this for too long, but there's so many incidents. I mean, I could do this all night. I could do a whole live stream just about this because it's the most bizarre thing. It's like even the political establishment doesn't really support Israel. It's bizarre. It's really, really, really bizarre. It's it's like Israel has is a, is a part of the Western capitalist imperialist apparatus that Western capitalism and imperialism is committed to maintaining. But there's this like subtle resentment against it that cannot be spoken. It's bizarre. It is really, really bizarre. Democrats and Republicans, left and right, it's the weirdest, weirdest thing ever. But anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking about that now. I'm sure I've said about 16 things to get me canceled there. It'll be all over Twitter tomorrow that Caleb announced on his live stream that he hates all the Jews and he wants to kill them all or something like that. That's not what I said. I didn't say that at any point in this stream tonight, but I'm sure there's a million things I just said that can be taken out of context to mean that I'm I'm evil. So just go ahead. Just go ahead. <sighs> it won't be the first time. So there you go. But anyway, uh, the last Super Chat question I got was from Yulia. And Yulia asked, what is the role that beauty will play in a socialist society? Yulia, I think that beauty will play an important role in socialism. Right? Kinky's right. Caleb is a baby-aiding Jew hater. Uh, that's what people are going to take from that. But, you know, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, and see, I mean, people agree. I mean, I'm, you know, anyway. Anyway, Yulia, I think beauty will be an important part of a socialist society. The Soviet Union, the Moscow subway system, which I have had the the honor of going to Russia and and you know taking part in, the Moscow subway system is beautiful. It is an amazing, beautiful thing. And Pyongyang, take a look at Pyongyang. Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea, is beautiful. And Part of the synthetic left has been the celebration of ugliness. It is. It runs every 15 minutes, all night long. And they have the your phone works on the Moscow subway, Gala. They have full Wi-Fi on the there's you have full cell service, full Wi-Fi on the train. It is it's like amazing, the Moscow subway. And it's beautiful. It was built by Stalin. And it's beautiful. And it's like it's like a work of art. The subways in New York City smell like urine. They smell like urine. Uh, you know, they're they're falling apart, they're disgusting. But the subways in, in Moscow are beautiful, and Pyongyang is beautiful. Beijing, you know, Beijing is beautiful. And that part of the synthetic left, part of the synthetic left has been this notion that beauty is fascist. Beauty is fascist, beauty is Nazi, and that being a leftist means you want everything to be sloppy. You know, leftists, you know, we all love poop, and we all love pornography, and we all love dirt, and, you know, thought slime. When I criticized this, this guy, thought slime, I pointed out the fact he calls himself thought slime is part of what synthetic leftism, that's, that's it, right? Synthetic leftism is about modern art, which was funded by the CIA, 
But look at, you know, even Roosevelt, when he was in an alliance with the Communist Party, go and look at some of the paintings. This is one of the most, this painting was commissioned. It was, you know, I'm going to pull this up. This, this painting, this painting was commissioned by the Roosevelt administration, the Works Progress administration. One of the things they did is they hired all kinds of artists to paint murals to go put in public buildings. And this mural was put in a public building in Kansas. It was put in the Kansas State Capitol building. And it is absolutely beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. And I can, yes, here we go. Here we go. This, this, this mural was commissioned by the Roosevelt administration. And it was put, it was put up in the, in the Kansas State Capitol building. Right. And this, this is, this is beautiful. Right. This. Look at this. It's John Brown. Right. This is this is beautiful art. This is social realism. That's what it's called. Um, and the Roosevelt administration commissioned an artist to paint this beautiful revolutionary portrait. That's John Brown with his rifle and his Bible. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful revolutionary portrait. Right. And it was commissioned by a communist. Right. Um, but there's many others. There's many others. I'll, I'll show you another example. Right. This is this is another work of uh, a WPA modern art. Right. Um, you know that. I mean, this is the art that was promoted by the Roosevelt administration. Right. This is the beauty that they promoted. Right. Oh, goodness. I got to get one that will let me. All right. Hold on. Hold your horses, folks. Hold your horses. Just trying to. Find some great examples of beautiful modern art. Here we go. Here's another one. All right. Right. Hold on. Hold on, folks. Hold on. All right. Just trying to get my windows. I hate sharing screens, honestly, but, you know, it's a good thing to do. So this is another mural, right? Again, this is what the kind of art that Roosevelt promoted. This is the kind of art that Roosevelt promoted. Look at this. No, no, it wasn't published in 2015. It's just from a New York Times article that was using it. But this is, you know, the kind of art that Roosevelt put up in public buildings. Beautiful stuff, right? It's the worker, the, 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 the strength of the worker, the working class that creates the wealth of the world, you know, and it's, it's showing working class power. Beautiful color stuff. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful, beautiful stuff, right? Um... This is the kind of art that the Roosevelt administration put up all across the United States. It's beautiful. They call it social realism. It's It's got a political message. This is about the power of the working class. It's socially conscious. It depicts working people. It's realistic. Social realism. It's very similar to socialist realism, right? Very similar. Dave Robbins, uh, David Rovix. It's David Rovix. Um, yeah. And Dorothy Day, Dorothy Day. Um, yeah. And I, I agree. And that that's part of what we do. That's part of the socialist movement. But like, let's talk about, you know, art in the Soviet Union. Right. Um, there's, there's a statue that was built, you know, in, in the Soviet Union. Um that I love. I just, it's beautiful. It is just absolutely beautiful. I'm going to put it here on the screen. This is a statue. This was, was built, you know, during the Stalin years. It's absolutely beautiful. Right. Um, you know, this is, this is, this is some of the art that socialism created. All right. Again, got to share our screen here. All right. Here we go. Here, this is this uh, this is a statue that was created by Stalin by the Soviet Union when they were beautifying and building up their their country with socialist central planning, right? It's beautiful stuff. Look at this. I have always loved this statue. It's the man and the woman. They're marching ahead towards the future. They got a hammer and a sickle. It's beautiful and it's huge. It's a huge statue. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. They're on top of a building there. I mean, it's beautiful stuff. 
beautiful stuff, right? This is what real leftist art looks like, right? This is what communists and socialists, when they were aligned with Roosevelt or when they're in power in the Soviet Union, this is the kind of art they create. Here's another one. I'll show you one last one before we stop here. All right, let me pull it up here. Um, this is a monument. This is a monument to the independence of Senegal. So Senegal is an African country, and they wanted to build a monument to celebrate their independence. Okay? They wanted to build a monument to celebrate the independence of Senegal. So who did they hire to make it? North Korea. They hired North Korea because North Korea is really good at making statues. They hired North Korea to design David Rovix. That's correct, John, to design their independence memorial. And it is an amazing memorial. And I'm going to pull it up for you here. This is the monument to the independence of Senegal. Look at this. That is a beautiful monument. That's what real communist art looks like. Look at that. It's got it's the African family. You got the father and the wife and the baby, and they're pointing toward freedom. I bet the Malthusians hate that, right? I bet you, I bet you contrapoints and thought slime and all of them can't stand that because the last thing they want is the people in Africa breeding, right? They think, oh, the problem's overpopulation. All these people in Africa, you know, are trying to breed, and then they build a statue of a family with a child pointing toward the future. This statue is like a giant fuck you to Malthusianism. That's what it is. Because all Bill Gates and 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 the Klaus Schwab and all of them, they hate the fact that people in Africa are having children. And they, they hate the fact that China is going to Africa and building a uh, high-speed railway and building electrical power plants. They want the people in Africa to stay poor. Barack Obama he went to Africa and he said, if everyone, if everyone here, look, look, I'm Barack Obama. Uh, if everyone here had a, uh, had a air conditioning and modern housing, uh, the planet would boil over. Uh, you just got, you guys got to stay poor because I'm Barack Obama. He hates, I bet Barack Obama seethes in rage when he sees this statue, right? He seethes in rage when he sees this statue, because this is the African people pointing toward the future, celebrating, having families and procreating and, 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 you know, I mean, that's why they couldn't stand Gaddafi because Gaddafi made an African country modern. He built the world's largest irrigation system, the great man-made river. This, this beautiful work of art, the North Koreans made this statue. This is beautiful, right? This is beautiful stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this statue is a giant F you to the Malthusians and to the degrowthers and, and all of them. Right. And it's, it's, in, it, this is in support of what China is doing in Africa, raising people out of poverty. This is in support of Russia's solidarity with Africa, with the Eurasian economic union. I mean, this, this statue is, is a really powerful political statement. If you think about it, right. And North Korea, the fact they hired North Korea to build this beautiful statue, this is the kind of beauty uh, that we would, we, Real socialism is about modern art and, you know, absurdism and all that kind of, you know, you know, the, you know, Jackson Pollock and all of that. That stuff is not what socialism is about. That stuff is a conscious distortion of socialism. Socialism is about the celebration of beauty and and it's about making life better. Right. It's about the idea that you have you have images and um you know, and things that are about trying to make people better. You know, this is better. Most men aren't that strong. Most women are not that good looking. Most babies aren't that adorable. It's supposed to be better than life, right? It's it's realism, but it's it's like to be aspired to. That's what real art is supposed to be. It's supposed to make you better. But if you watch modern, you know, modern movies, modern paintings, modern music, it, it makes you feel depressed. It makes you feel hopeless. Not this stuff. Right. This is what art is supposed to do. The responsibility of the artist is to make the audience better, to make the audience better. And this is art that makes the audience better. So there you go. That's my tirade about beauty and the role of beauty and socialism in modern life. So there you go, folks. I think we're going to we went three hours tonight, three hours. I got work in the morning. That's OK. I love you all and I love our community so much. It's worth it. It's worth it. I could talk to you guys all night. I'll probably be back tomorrow. I'll probably be back tomorrow, y'all. So thanks for everything. We're going to put on the closing music here tonight. Um, I'm going to put on the closing music. And uh, 
We'll be back. We'll be back. I love you all. Talk to you all. Upsurge. In the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. Good night, everybody.